Hello everyone and welcome to the very first Taylor Talks podcast. I'm your host Ryan Taylor and I'm joined today by a rugby league legend. Over 550 games, 131 tries to Lee, Wigan, Warrington and St. Helens and a try for England, four appearances for England and four for Great Britain. It's the one and only Mr. Mickey. Hiya Mickey, welcome to the show. Hiya Ryan, you alright? Thanks for having me. Thanks very much for being the first guest. Like I said, it's another thing to add to your list of long achievements in your career. Yeah. Yeah, first, first on this time, so, <laughs> no, it's something good, good to be doing, something like this, isn't it, especially during these yeah. times, it's, it's something people should listen to or, you know, occupying for a bit, so yeah, it should be good. Yeah, um, before obviously we talk about rugby in your career, how are you and the family coping with all the lockdown and the COVID-19, because obviously the last time I saw you, we played whole KI in the Challenge Cup, and who'd have thought six, seven weeks later, so won't see anybody for all this period of time. Right. Yeah, it's um, it's it's weird, isn't it? It's just that unknown that you know nothing ever, nothing's ever happened like this before. Certainly not since we've been around. So it's um, but yeah, family are all good. My two are two boys loving it all. They think they're um, they think they're extended summer holidays. I think <laughs> kind of get them do some homework. It's like they just refuse and they won't do homework. Um, sat on their Xboxes fighting. It's um, it's it's all they're they're enjoying it. It's just trying to keep them from killing each other, really. So but no, we're all, we're all well fit and well. So that's the main thing. Who's in charge of homeschooling you or the missus who's took over teacher role? No, I've thrown that to Kate. Um, it should be me, really, because, but I can't. I've not got patience at the moment, so Kate's trying to get them, <laughs> get them going, but they just, they just won't do it. <laughs> and obviously, with your strength and conditioning coach role at Lee Centurions, how are you finding with the lads? Obviously, you're not in there on the training pitch every day, and how are you finding that they're doing with the training at home? Obviously, we've seen on. Instagram and social media that they are sticking to train routines but do you find it hard that you're not the pushing them every day? Yeah, yeah, it's difficult because obviously they're limited within what they can lift and I say it's difficult when there's only one or two of you running you, sometimes you don't know how, how hard you're pushing yourself sometimes but they are pretty going off what I've seen in the videos like uh, me and Dusk just get them for, send some videos in just so we have a look at what they're doing and they're um, yeah, they're training pretty hard to be honest they're doing the best they can so it's I can't really ask much more of them, but it's just, like I say, it's just frustrating when you're not there with them and, you know, in that day-to-day oh, yeah. that you've been used to. And I know the lads are, yeah, they're finding it hard, but um, to, at the same time, they're really, um, they're really ripping and training hard they can. So we're doing every, everything we can for hopefully when the green light goes ahead that we can get back in at the ground run. There will be a few, obviously we'll be, be behind in issues like skill and your contact with your defence and stuff, but... It's one of them things, we'll just get, have to get up to speed with that. I'm guessing it'll be like a second pre-season, won't it, again, for the lads, and obviously when they come back in and they'll be training again, you're going to get that fitness back up again, and all, all, and I'm guessing it's going to be behind closed doors once all sports will start back up again. How different is that going to be for like, teams like where you rely on the fans and the atmosphere to get them going, especially if they're in a tough game and time to hard? Yeah, I know, it's going to be a bit surreal. I remember watching a couple of the NRL games before they, they showed, they were behind closed doors, and it's like, just looks like a training session, like against two teams training, but um, say if that's, what has, if that's what has to happen, then so be it. I'm sure hopefully we'll, we'll find a way where fans, whether they watch it at home on TV and stuff, you know, get the laptops out and watch it. I'm sure we'll try and sort something out to do that, but obviously just not about going to miss that atmosphere. Certainly, you know, the Lee fans behind us, you know, I'm underway, so it's that'll be difficult when they're not going to be going to be there with us. But hopefully, it, say it won't be for too long. But again, we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it. So let's go back all the way back to the start. And what was life like in Lee growing up for you before you see a played rugby? What was the town of Lee like? Obviously, different to what it is in the eighties. So what was it like for growing up for you? Yeah, it's um, again, you you're a Lee lad. You brought up on you know I brought up on Wigan Road near the Marsh playing fields. You know, so every Every holidays and <coughs> breaks and weekends, I was, you know, obviously playing rugby as a kid, but I was on the on the marshes, the ball in my hand, running around football, rugby, whatever. And the other side, we had the we had the like the we called the flash at the back, where you know we used to go out on our bikes and stuff. So yeah, yeah. just a, a lad who loved, loved being outdoors when we were young. All my mates nearby used to meet up on bikes. They know there were no mobile phones back then. It was ring the house phone or when we're going to listen. I'll see you tomorrow at ten o'clock, or whatever. And, Obviously, times have changed now. It's all, you know, all over the phones and medias and messages and social media and that. So it's, um, no, it's a shame, really, that kind of kids don't really have that, what it was like years ago when you, 
you have to get on your bike and go all the side of Lee to meet your mate and knock on door, see if you're coming out, not ring him and text. So, but yeah, just a um, you know a lad who just loved dossing about when I was a kid, like obviously with all the, always with a ball in my hand. So was it always rugby that you wanted to do even from a very young age? Is that always your first memories is involving a rugby ball or a football and other sports? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I always enjoy sport. You know, um, I do remember like just reenacting it out. Like we, used, me and a couple of mates, we used to go marshes and we used to play under them on top tries because the video out at the time top tries. We used to always play with top tries, especially when it was wet and we used to come back absolutely top to toe in mud. But them things you did them days, it were like it was it was the norm. Get changed at back door, get in, have a shower, and watch a bit of telly. So yeah, always out and about sporting. You know, it's um, so I've probably always. Oh, I've always, I always dreamed of playing rugby as well. Being a Lee lad, playing for Lee as well. Because remember, go, I used to watch him on my way when I was a kid. Uh, Hilton Park, you know, places like that. Old before Windy Scotland up, Norton Park at the time, Boulevard at Hull FC. I've been to them all watching Lee. You know, so it was kind of brilliant as a kid going there. And who were you rugby heroes growing up? Obviously, I should, the other league out showed the Lee Wembley final the other day against Leeds Round, as I'm sure. I always mean, thought like your parents would have told you about that, but who was your heroes watching Lee from the stands at Hilton Park? Um, it's a difficult one, really. I, I kind of I, I love rugby in general, but obviously I like watching like the Wigan St. Helens as well. You know, like when they're in the old Division yeah. One. But um, you know, I thought Ellery Hanley for me was unbelievable when I was growing up. You know, I kind of people I kind of remember from Lee well, I had to be honest it was like people like Timmy Street and that when they were playing him you know watching Timmy how he played he was brilliant he was a fan's favourite and then to get a chance to play alongside Timmy for a season and half it was um, a bit of a dream come true really um, so no, Tim, Timmy Street was always one that certainly stood out <coughs> I used to like Dean Anger as well the winger Dean he was lightning Dean Anger he ended up going to Warrington for a few seasons um, and I think he scored a right blinder at Central Park or Wiggins ground it was absolutely packed one. That was a Challenge Cup game. I can't remember our league game. That's a one that stood out in the. I remember, I think Wigan kicked the ball behind the stands and all the Lee fans robbed the rugby ball. They won't give it back. So we had like stop play for about mm. 10 minutes. They kept throwing the ball away from stewards. Remember that? I'm like a, I'm like a Thursday <laughs> night or something like Wigan. So, yeah, there are a couple. So, obviously, you decided then you wanted to pursue rugby as a career and you ended up going to one of the local amateur clubs at Lee East. What was that like? Obviously, we've seen the training pitch at Lee East is different now to when it was when you were training growing up. So, what was the Lee East like for you growing up? Yeah, well, I first started off, I was, it was Lee Rangers when I first started. I, had, I did a year or two there and then I moved over to Lee East. And that's where I played most of my, my junior career. And obviously, Lee East, the old ground when I played, was where um, the, the new... See, call now next to being q It's like the, the new, I can be oh. medical centre, whatever it is. Um, yeah. And obviously, we had the, the good old Lee's pitch, and we used to have the all weather at the side, and it was like literally, if you fell on there or tripped up and scraped your hands and knees, you you had scabs for about, you had scabs for about four or five weeks. Um, you couldn't put your boots on there, with trainers on the all weather, but um, yeah, good memories though. You know, I really enjoyed it playing the Lee's. Yeah, good, good pitch. When you get a chance to play on that main pitch, it was brilliant. You know, I had a few people watching and some, some dark nights on that <laughs> all-weather pitch. It was, um, but that's what kind of you used to as a kid. You, you know nothing else and, you know, it kind of sets you up for when you're later in life, really. And was you always a number nine or did you have any business and all changes when you started? Um, yeah, probably. Obviously, when you when I first came, when I first broke through, when I was like, at, at mine, you usually put, you put a young lad on the wing and, <clears throat> I think I played a few games up wing and a few people went round there and I just kept like chopping people down legs tackling I think somebody said it's, I think it's time he might move into mid layer so I think it was Ray Fisher at the time my first ever coach at Lee Rangers he used to have the butchers on Warrington Road Ray and he moved me to Ucker and then kind of just stayed at nine ever since then and obviously then from Lee East you go to the main club in Lee which is Lee Central and how did that move first come about when did you first know that you were going to sign professionally for the Lee team um, I think it was about, was about no, for about 15 16 playing for Lee East and um, I don't know if Keith Le Eric Hughes and Keith Lane were involved at Lee at the time and I know a few of my mates had been signed for Warrington and St Tellings and that and kind of like <clears throat> nothing really come up that way you know my dad just remember my dad just saying like just keep playing enjoying your rugby you know don't worry about anything else it's as long as you're enjoying it and you're doing keeping you 
active in that. But we're about it. So, yeah, kind of just carried on as normal. And then I think Lee come knocking and said, you know, would you be interested in time for Lee? Keep playing for Lee and that and then move over to the academy when you're old enough and stuff. So, yeah, I kind of did that. You know, it was a kind of bit surreal, really, from watching them as a kid and going watching Hilton Park and that to get a chance to sign from them. I didn't hesitate, you know, being a Lee lad. You always want to play for your hometown club, so I did that. Signed for Lee and so I just carried on then playing and obviously as years went on I got the chance to play. So do you remember your first training session as well when you moved up into a pro rank? Do you remember was it a daunting experience like you're a young young yeah. lad and you see all these pros do you think oh god I've forgotten myself in for here? Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, like you know, I was skinny little skinny kid about eleven and a half stone and <laughs> I walked into a room, you know, with like Obviously, Lee at the time, they had some experienced players, some younger lads who were kind of new, but were a few years older than me. So, yeah, it was quite daunting walking into the old gym under the stand and, you know, lads who's been doing weights for a long time, hadn't really done much and but just kind of, just try to get straight uh, stuck in. I remember, you know, remember at the time, I can't think it was now, but like, um, you're Andy Furclough, some people like that at the time and they just said, come on, get over here, young gun, let's get, get cracking and... You know, they just took you in straight away. And I think that you found that in most rugby teams and players, no matter how many games they've played or caps they've had for the country, that they're, they're all down to earth and they all just, you know, welcome, really welcoming them. Yeah, I kind of did some pre-season testing that year. Uh, played mostly A team that year and then I think he Millwall come over that, I think he was the end of that year and I got a chance under Ian. End of that, uh, I think it was the end of the 99 season. So, yeah, I had a few seasons in the academy, playing the A team and I got a chance 99 in first team and kind of took it both hands really what was that moment like when Ian Mulder said right we're going to give you the opportunity now go and run with it I'm guessing as early as that must have been like you were pinching yourself you must have been dreaming at that point yeah it was um, it was a challenge cup game it was Barrow away in the challenge cup and he said I'm going to play this week I like you what first <laughs> play for the this week I was like I like wow so yeah I told my mum and dad and you know my, my dad were, obviously my dad being a Lee fan since he was probably in the eye, you know, he were, he were, he were absolutely made up. So, my dad and I think a couple of his friends, they travelled up to Barrow that day, yeah, 99. I think we might have got, I don't know if we won or not, I can't remember, it was this, the old Silk Cut Challenge Cup then. Um, but he was just a brilliant experience to, you know, get in the first team and play some minutes and, you know, kind of try and stake a claim really that you, you know, you want, you want to play more games. So, yeah, it was, um, it was a memory that I'll always remember. And it was funny because, might have learned them, John and Duff's mentioned it, was it 99, 20 years later, I made my 550th game in the same park, at the same place at Barra. So my first career game was at Barra, and then my 550th was at Barra. So, yeah, it's, um, and, again, and it not changed one bit, the Barra's pitch and <laughs> the engine rooms, it was same, it was same from 20 years ago. Oh yeah, I was, I was there at Barra commentating on Lee TV for you for that 550th game, I remember that, and... That was, like I said, it's one of the old-fashioned rugby ground as well. They share it with the football club as well. Don't be at Barra Barra Football Club at that as well. Right, so we were just saying then about your home debut when you were there with your friends and family all in the stands at Hilton Park. Um, do you remember who the game was against, your first home game? No, I, c- I can't. I don't, I don't know whether it was Wakefield in the Challenge Cup. I can't remember. Might have been Wakefield. Wakefield in the Challenge Cup might have been my home debut. Um, I think I scored in that game as well. But we got a bit. Remember Bobby Gould? Sure, Bobby Gould in one game with a forward pass. And Stuart Cummins never give the ch- never, never give it, pull it back, and they scored a winner. <clears throat> but yeah, I remember being that being a real tough physical game because they were a Super League team at the time, where it feel full time. Remember, be, remember it being so fast. But yeah, I just remember the crowd, warm day, packed, seeing a lot of familiar faces. Honestly, me proper jelly legs and you know dry mouth from the adrenaline. But um. That's a moment I'll never forget, Debbie and Hilton Park. I do miss that ground, to be honest. As much as I love LSV, yeah. LSV's brilliant. But there's just something about Hilton Park when you just come out in that corner and warm up and, you know, a real close, close um, atmosphere. It was brilliant. God, I remember when we used to do school shit to Hilton Park and all you ever used to see was them ice baths. You know, the bins that used to be the ice baths. I envied all the players for getting one of them. Glad I oh. weren't playing in one of them. <laughs> so... Well, things, Mark. Still, they're still going around now, you know what I mean? You can't be yeah. a good ice bath after games. It's just that, you know, people say that there's no scientific study that, that, that they do work, but for me, I think they do work. If it's just in, in your head that you feel like your legs are refreshed, it, I think I think they're good. <laughs> so, obviously, from that, you did well at Lee, and you managed in 2001 to get a move to St. Helens. Now, when I was doing the research, apparently Halifax was 
de- determined that you were going there. I mean, we were called Halifax Blue Sox at the time. What actually happened there? Were you meant to go to Halifax or was it always the case that St. Helens came in and more would you going back with your coach? No, no, I do remember how it, how it happened, to be honest with you. I remember speaking to Ian about St. and originally he just said, listen, I'd love to bring you to St. Helens, but <clears throat> at the moment, mate, there's, there's nothing. I can't get here at the moment. There's nothing for you, so <clears throat> just keep doing what you're doing. And um, Halifax did come in, and um, I did I did sign for Halifax. To be honest, me and Stuart Donlan signed at the time. We both me and Stu both went, and um, I don't think Lee was too happy about it. I think Paul Turns at the time wanted me to stay <clears throat> and like do another year at Lee, which you know it's fair enough. I just said, listen, you know, get some more experience, and you probably move on. You know, another year from now. But um, again, Halifax Blue Sox, they're in Super League at the time. I just thought it's an opportunity I've always dreamt to play in Super League. You know, I've, I've watched it for years. And at the time, I didn't think I could turn it down. So I signed for Halifax, did about three, four weeks pre season. <clears throat> but, um, <coughs> excuse me, something happened um, regarding Lee and Halifax. I don't think it was like a disagreement in transfer fee. Because I think Halifax might have paid a bit of a Put the fee for me. I don't know what happened. So anyway, I went to the tribunal at the Red Hall and basically the judge ruled that he said, listen, you're a free agent, Mickey. So I'll just go away, have a think about what you want to do, whether you go back to Lee, sign for Halifax or whatever. So I kind of, just on the way home, Mike Latham was my agent at the time, so we're on the, we're on the way home with Mike and I don't know what, how he Millward had got wind of it, <clears throat> but he, um, he, he phoned Mike and just said, listen, I've heard that about the ruling at the tribunal that Mickey's a free agent. He said, does he want to come and sign for St. Helens? So I kind of, I just thought, well, <coughs> not against any other clubs, I think. At the, at the time, the grand final champions have come knocking. Um, I couldn't turn it down, so I ended up signing for St. Helens. And especially, like you said, with the coach, who probably brought you through to Lee as well, with Ian Millwood, it's one of them. You can't say no to a club like St. Helens, really, can you? And especially playing under the likes of Keane and Cunningham and Brissart as well, oh. it must have been. Such a learning curve for you as, as a player. Hundred percent. That was one of the reasons I did go. You know, I could have, I don't know, potentially stayed at Halifax and been straight in number nine there, and you know, made a, kind of a role your own. But I don't know. I just thought that for me, as a where I was as a person, and what I wanted to do was thank you, test yourself with the you know the best players and try and play against the best and with them. So yeah, learned learned a lot when I went to St Helens, and, and, and to be honest with you. Managed to play a lot of games as well in the time I was there, so... And obviously St. Helens at that point were probably, and we still are classed as one of the most successful teams in British rugby league as well. You look at some of the players at Saints as well, the likes of your Sean Longs, your Chris Jones, your Kieran Cunningham's, and obviously like we, we all see the tries and the clips of Saints, especially the uh, Wide to West try as well against yeah. Bradford. Um, it must be nice to be a part of a team like that who are always fighting at the top and always looking to get to Old Trafford come October time to win a challenge to win the Grand Final and win the Super League yeah definitely and like you could just see that the professionals when I went there like how they train apply themselves and again I went from doing a season or two season half at Lee and then uh, the change to St. Helens and I remember walking and walking the gym at St. Helens for, for the first time when I'd just signed <laughs> and I think they were like the first two people I saw was Kevin Ira and Sonny Nickel they were about six foot five and about eighteen stone both, and I was like, "Wow!" And then I turned to the left, and Paul School thought on bench press with Kieran Cunningham. And I'm like, "I am literally playing with like giants here at the moment." So, but again, no airs and graces on them. They all just welcome me in, and I pretty got just got up to speed as quick as I could. Train, train as hard as I can, did extras, and you know it took me a couple of a good two or three seasons to put a bit of weight on. But you know it was at the time I was. I had quite a bit of decent bit of speed and, and could and managed punch above my weight. So yeah, I held my own and you know it was um it was brilliant playing centre. And again, playing that knows the road, the old ground, very similar to Lee, dead close atmosphere was unbelievable and it was just a pleasure to really train and you know, with great players and you know, really test yourself. And there was always that saying, wasn't there? There was always same times, never right off the saints, you don't know when they're beaten and Oh, does that all that come from this dressing room and like the training where even in training you don't know when you're beaten, you keep going, keep going and that's why you find that Saints at that period were always near enough at Old Trafford in the Grand Finals? Yeah, definitely. Massive part of it. You know, we trained, 
we trained to a high intensity. You know, everybody challenged each other. Like even just like sided games against each other. You know, both teams wanted to win even in training and in the gym. We pushed each other, you know, to to perform better and increase your weight or what, whatever it were. Um, you know, and Ian, Ian Mill a lot at the time, you know, he played a style of rugby that I don't think a lot of teams played like us. You know, we, every team had a game plan, but, you know, he always said, listen, if you can see some space, whether it's two yard off your line or two yard off their line, you take that space and, and play what's in front of you. So we, were, we had a lot of good, naturally talented rugby players at the time who could play rugby. It was good, you know, they were, they were smart, but also they had that off the cuff mentality as well that you play what you see, like Cunningham, Sean Longscullies, Tommy Martin at the time as well. You know, um, other ones, you know, and Jim Elaine come and Willie Tillow, Martin Gleeson. You know, we, we, we had a lot of players that were natural rugby players as well, which was good. And, you know, Paul Wellens at the back and people, it's, you know, it were, we just never knew we were beaten, even if we were, you know, I remember watching a couple of highlights a few weeks back, actually, you know, trying to kill a few a bit of time. Um, yeah. We played at Warrington, one of the other clubs, and I think we were 18 0 down with about eight minutes ago, or 16, and we ended up winning 18 16 and scored right on the last second. It just, it just epitomised what St. were about at the time. I must ask you as well, I mean, obviously, as part of the St. Scored, and they did win the grand final in 2002. Now, I want your opinion on this, and I want you to be brutally honest. Was Chris Joint a voluntary tackle at the end? On your yeah. opinion, no, you wouldn't give it. No, no <laughs> it, it went. He went down, obviously went down, and they were, they were um, I remember Fielder and Jimmy Lowell shouting out, but to be fair, Jointy, when he went down, he realised he, he might have gone down early, but he carried on moving. He didn't just lie there and play the ball, so he did move. Obviously, the Bradford boys wanted to repel it because Deacon had probably kicked the goal and won the game, but... And back in them days as well, Saints and Bradford was the main rivalry, wasn't it? And look at Saints, so we're going to stop up Bradford. I mean, look, look, look at Bradford are now, obviously, we've had the money difficulties. But when you look at that Bradford team of the early 2000s, that was the main route. It was always saying to Bradford at Old Trafford, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, massive. They were a great side then, Bradford. Big side, aggressive, strong. But for some reason, we used to always play well against Bradford. I used to love playing Bradford. I, I love playing Odsall. I used to, obviously, it used to be a brilliant atmosphere. Well, it still is a great atmosphere, you know, considering what troubled times they've had. They've still got a great following. And, but the atmosphere years ago when they were in Super League, it was brilliant. Friday nights there, it was rocking. So, obviously... I think you were part of the 2004 side that won the Challenge Cup, but I think you missed that game through injury, didn't you? What was that like? Yeah, on the, yeah that, was, that was probably right one of playing. my... Yeah, probably one of the toughest moments in my career, that, to be honest. Chance of first winning a, a Challenge Cup, and I broke my foot in the semi-final, and, you know, there was no chance of playing. You know, still in, I was still in cast at an operation. It was, um, it was a tough day, that, to go to the stadium and with the lads after the game and hobble round on crutches with a big smile on your face. Saying well done. It's that's the I think that's the tough side that a lot of people don't see when you you know you have them dark days on your own trying to train on your own and all your mates are out playing and especially in game, big games like that. But I kind of just try to I try to use that as a motivator when I got back fit and you know it made me all more determined to you know to be a part of them games and try and get there again. So obviously we didn't we didn't quite do that in the last couple of years at Saints, but I think we won a league leaders the year after. A um, couple of semi-finals, but yeah, it's that's the highs and lows of sport, right? You know, you kind of take the highs, but you also you've yeah. got to you've got to cut them lows as well. And it's I think that's what makes you a player sometimes when you can how you can deal with that adversity. So yeah, one of them things. And is it Mickey? Are you moving to another club about a bit of transfer saga from a Yorkshire club? Is it because you obviously left St. Helens in two thousand and six? You felt you weren't gaining enough game time with the Kieran Cunningham playing in the form that he was and James Roby was going to think starting emerging at that point and yeah. for all the money it looked like he was going to join Bradford and initially it was announced that he was going to join Bradford from St. Helens and then the day after I think it was the day after you actually joined Wigan Warriors so what was the full story behind that because it's a case of it looks like from the outside that Saints wouldn't sell to Wigan for you to go there so Bradford kind of acted like the middle club because I know Bradford got Terry Newton from Wigan as part of yeah. the deal, I think. So what, from your side, what was the full story behind the whole Saints, Bradford, Wigan triangle? Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right, mate. <coughs> Saints just wouldn't sell me to Wigan at the time. Chairman Eamon McManus just said, listen, I ain't, I ain't selling you to our biggest rival, Wigan. You know, you know what Saints, Wigan rivalry is like, it's massive. Yeah. So I said, well, I've agreed terms, mate. You know, it's a good deal. Ian, Ian's earned. You know, I've been told them. 
I can leave from Daniel Anderson at the time. The co coach at Saints, he said, well, he said, yeah, it's fair enough, but I'm not selling you to Wigan. So I think somehow Wigan and the agents, whoever managed to speak to Bradford and I think Bradford like reluctantly said, right, yeah, we'll do that. I think, cause I think Bradford were interested as well at the time or a year or two before. And to be honest with you, if it, if it hadn't have panned out well, I'd have, I'd have, I would have gone to Bradford and, you know, I'd have played there because, you know, Bradford still a massive club at the time, you know, I kind of, if there was a chance of me going there, definitely I would have played there because it's you know it was a big team. But it was always the plan that I'll sign for Wigan and Bradford do the swap deal with myself and Terry. So yeah, it just kind of nothing seemed to run smoothly to be honest with me. I don't know why because I'm not. Well, I think I'm an alright bloke. I'm not too bad. And but yeah, it's that was the deal. It was sign for Bradford do a swap deal with Terry and then just move on because just because Saints won't sell me to Wigan. That's all. So. Obviously, you said you'd join back again with Ian Millwood at Wigan, and I think it's fair to say that season um, didn't really run smooth. Wigan, we had two points deducted at the start of the season. I can't tell you what for. I've just read the thing, and um, Wigan at that point, they were struggling near the bottom of the Super League, weren't we, at that point? But we had a good squad, so I don't, what do you think it was at Wigan that year that just didn't click? Because you look at Wigan, you always think uh, champions, and they were uh, so close to relegation, weren't they? Yeah, it was um, it was a difficult year. First six games, I don't think I think we lost every game, and I was like just pondering, like, have I made the right decision here? Just thought, oh god, what what have I done here at times? But <clears throat> again, the support was fantastic. We're going to well supported, and we did have a lot of injuries early on, a lot of setbacks. We were trying to bring players in on loan, and you know, being that early in the year, you're not you're not going to get you know a lot of players available. So it was kind of getting what you can. And obviously we had a few, we had lads low on confidence, <clears throat> not fully fit and it was difficult, really difficult. And when you lose two or three games, it becomes a bit of a habit then, you know, it gets nervy and, <coughs> excuse me, you could see that we were, we looked, we looked edgy and nervy and, you know, we, we were losing games, we should be winning. But to be fair, we kind of, <coughs> we kind of rallied around. I think Brian Noble come in, got the job when Emil Ward got sacked. He brought Stuart Fielding with him and, just give us a big, give us a big lift. I thought a real astute signing at the time as well was Michael Dobson. We got Michael Dobson in on half back and just kind of can't think down a bit. He kicked really well. You know, he got us around the park. It was. Um, I think we ended up going on a on like a sixteen game, fifteen game winning run, and it got us. I think we're just a point outside the top six at the end of it because we we're about four points adrift at, at the bottom of the league. I thought, right, we're going to get relegated to Wigan. I thought, how bad would that be? So. But fortunate enough, we you know we pulled it out and we got that bit of quality that was shown that we could do it. And I think the crowds at that year for Wigan, I believe, were like biggest crowds I've ever had for like years. And we we're like at wrong end of the table, so it's just shows the support Wigan have, have always had. But does that kind of play into like a positive for players? Or like you think, oh my, like we don't want to be known as the team that gets Wigan relegated to the championship. We don't want to be tarnish with that brush for the rest of our careers does that kind of think right we need to push on we need to give the rest of the kick up the arse and get back forward and get us to where we should be which is near the top of the table yeah certainly I did not sure whether every, every player did that but um, maybe not realised how big a club Wigan were but I think when Maurice Lindsay were chairman at the time before Ian Lennigan come in he kind of brought a few ex-players in like with Sean Wayne at the time who were I think he might have been coaching the, um, the juniors and you got a couple of other ex-players in just to tell kind of like what it means to play for Wigan you know, and being Wigan lads, and I think that kind of probably hit home with a few lads after that, we kind of arrived, you know, because obviously you, you probably ask a lot of people that over all over the world, <coughs> name, a Wigan, name a rugby club from England, and they'll always name Wigan as one of the first to choose, because it's a massive club, so I think it kind of hit home, and to be fair, Brian Noble at home a bit as well, you know, obviously Brian coming from Bradford, but, you know, he just said like, you know, you what position you're in here playing for one of the biggest clubs in the world so we yeah, it kind of hit home and we kind of all rallied around and you know we end up we end up hitting some good form and you know putting a lot of good sides you know to, to one side and, and going on a, a late surge but um, it was just it probably a bridge too fast again the playoffs that, that year but you know it gave us something to build on and I was reading as well you was really ever present to the team in that year and you was also part of the first team to play Catalan in Super League as well over in France that obviously, when you were in Super League, it was all clubs basically from the M62 corridor from Lancashire to Yorkshire. What was it like going over to France and playing against the Catalan Dragons in the like, infancy years? 
yeah, it was good to be honest. It was um, it was a new experience. Obviously, I'd been a I'd been abroad like with international honours, but we were not not so much club rugby. And, you know, I remember it being a, it was a Saturday evening there, dark in an electric atmosphere, real parties on. You know, it's like over there, you get really involved. And I don't think we're ever going to win that game that night. It was always the Catalans. We did actually bomb a few tries. We should have won it, but. I think it was always going to be Catalan Dragons night that night. And yeah, it was a brilliant experience. You know, they had, a, they had some stars. They had like Stacey Jones and a few more, you know, star study plays in there as well. But no, for a player, to them, they got the job done the night. It was nice It was nice to be, a, you know, part of the first ever game for Catalans over there. But I'm saying wrong end of the score. And then from Wigan again, you move again to the north, across the northwest, <laughs> going to Warrington Wolves. How did that move come about? Was it a case of one you needed a player? You you felt like you could do what you do, did at Wigan, or did Brian Noble think right? We're going a different direction from here. Yeah, kind of a bit disappointed how it ended at Wigan. To be honest, kind of got like two two tales of a story. One from the coach, one from the chairman, saying like um, he doesn't he doesn't want you, and then the other one was saying, well, he doesn't want you. And it was like you just. I think just as a person, as a bloke, certainly in sport or rugby, you just want a bit of honesty, whether it's good news or bad news. And just felt I didn't quite get that at the end. And to be honest with you, I thought my form was pretty good in me last year at Wigan. I think I got like runner up player of the year, got selected for international back in England, fold in a World Cup, and Wigan didn't want me. You know, I remember quite a few of the fans were like kind of disappointed that we were leaving. I, th- I thought we could have strengthened in er- other areas than hooky position, but they, you know, they kind of. Said, you know, we're not going to renew your contract. They brought, I think they brought that Matt Riddell in, which, you know, not nothing against that guy. You know, I don't really know him, but I didn't think I needed to replace him for, for him, to be honest. But, um, well, that was out of my hands. And kind of, to be honest, I was a bit worried at the time because there, were, there wasn't a lot, nothing a lot available. Because <laughs> they've left it quite late in the year. A lot of teams were already planned and, you know, sorted for next year. And it was like, speaking to a couple of clubs, but there was nothing really there. And it was like, it was worrying times because, you know, set yourselves on playing rugby for a little bit longer and potentially nothing there. But it was worrying them. I think um, almost like last minute, Warrington, something come available at Warrington and Huddersfield come available. So I was kind of choosing between them two really at the end of it. And, you know, I just, yeah, I just went with Warrington and, you know, I, I had end up having six and a half billion years there. How much does family I right, involve like I watched the family coming to think of a chance move because obviously you'll have had a young family at the time as well, um, and you don't really. Want, I'm guessing it was a case of you, you're at home, you're settled, and everything. You didn't want to like drive, do a trip to Yorkshire, and you end up every day. Is that coming to yeah. as well? Yeah, obviously. I think when you, you know you do have family, it does change. You know your your priorities, your circumstances change. So I think Warrington made more sense at the time. You know, I think if others feel the or somewhere had been the only option, I'd, I'd have had to take it, but. Again, what Kate, my wife, and the kids are dead supportive. They'd have, they'd have had no problems going anywhere where I go, to be honest. So, and you know, to be honest, Huddersfield at the time, it, it was probably only take you, you know, on a good day, if you set up early, it could take you 45, 50 minutes. So it worked massive. But no, it, I've been fortunate to, you know, to stick locally. So travel's never been an issue and moving out and stuff. So it has, it has, it has helped. But, um, sorry, go on. no problem. No, sorry. That's- uh, Kate, Kate would have had any problem, you know, moving if we need to move or anything. So then, obviously, like you said, you spent six, six and a half brilliant years at Warrington where you won silver, where you won Challenge Cups, got to Grand Finals, and you kind of boosted Warrington up to that level where they are now. What are your fondest memories looking back at your time at the Wolves? Does that first Challenge Cup win always stick out in the back of your mind? Yeah, it does. It does, certainly for the town and the club of Warrington. You know, they, they've been so long since they got there, and to be a part of that first time in 30 odd years, it was fantastic. And, it was my first game back from injury as well, which was, you know, kept me, kept me blessings really. That I kind of, Tony Smith said, if you fit this week, I'm, I'm going to play. So I did everything I could and went for the, I, know, I was out with a bicep rupture. So I was out for like a term week. And he said, I've spoke to a few of the senior boys as well. And if you fit, they want you to play. So I kind of did some testing. And my testing was ahead where I should have been. So I said, I'm playing and, you know, put my hand up and got a bench spot in the final. So brilliant, yeah. But I think especially after it was the year after, to go back to Wembley at, and win the trophy again back to back. I think that makes special teams me, you know, when teams can go back and defend the trophy or win it again. It's, um, so, yeah, 9 10 was fantastic. And there are two, you know, two, two ones that do stick out. 
Um, obviously, you just mentioned then, Mike, you were, you were there to schedule. You, you obviously missed out on the 2004 Challenge Cup final for injuries you mentioned previously. So how much of, like, how much did you want to try and get yourself fit because you didn't want to miss out on another moment like you did all them years ago again in 2009? Yeah, yeah, it was almost, I was thinking, crime. I'm not, I don't think it's meant to be me in Challenge Cups because in the semi-final they were brilliant. And I remember watching it thinking, God, I'm, I hope I don't. I'm hoping I've got a chance of playing here in the final because I'd hate it miss another. So it was, yeah, it just made me again, it made me that bit more determined because I had a bit longer. Because I've had the, I had, had the injury previous to the semi final, so I was, I was, you know, ahead of where I was in the 04. So yeah, it just, it just made me determined if I'm going to do everything I can to see if I can get back and be available. And fortunately for me, you know, I was. And then Super League obviously started bringing in Magic Weekend. I think it started off. I think it was in Cardiff or Scotland. I think it started off. It wasn't one yeah. than the other. Yeah. Murrayfield. I think it started off. What was that like to kind of play at these like rugby union stadiums at Murrayfield and the Millennium Stadium as it was in Cardiff? What was it like to play at them kind of grounds? Yeah, I enjoyed it. Again, it just gave you that get that atmosphere of like a big game feel. I think it was good for players to experience that. You know, obviously I played at stadiums before and stuff, but I think certainly I had club games and it gave me that it gave me that final feel. So yeah. I've always enjoyed the Magic Weekend. It's been good. You know, I'm just gutted I never got a chance to play at Anfield because, you know, I'm a bit of a Liverpool fan. You know, I'm not, not a massive fan, but, you know, it'd be nice to play there. But, yeah, I've always enjoyed um, the Magic Weekends. I think it's just brought the whole rugby together and, and give it like that. It gives it that cup final feel for a weekend. Out of all the venues the Magic Weekend, which is your favourite? I know all the fans have been guessing it's Newcastle, so is that, that ring true to you as a player as well as Newcastle is the favourite for Magic Weekend? Well, I was, I was I was injured at Newcastle when we played Salford for Lee, so a bit gutted to play that one, but um, I really enjoyed um, Etihad. Manchester, yeah. I, I really, yeah, I thought Man City was brilliant. Dead central, you know, like say M62 corridor with all your teams and that got the, yeah. And then Definitely you get... Man, yes. You get to your first grand final with Warrington as well against your old club in Wigan as well. Um, and Warrington for the first half were dominating the game. How much do you think the, the injury to Joel Mon- Monaghan just before half time changed that game? Yeah, it just it suddenly just put, it put a stop on the game. There were stoppages and you know it kind of took stopped our momentum and they actually scored from like a player two after that, which was disappointing. You know they shouldn't be scoring from there, and it kind of just gave Wigan a lift. You know going into half time under all that pressure, to want to be like. Was it 16 6 down or whatever, 14 6? It were, I think it gave them a bit of a, a lifeline. And I think if we'd have gone in 16 nil up or whatever, I think I don't think they'd have had enough to come back. And then we had a, another injury that kind of cemented it that we were at night. Was I think when Steph Retchford got his ankle done from behind. I'll never forgive Harrison Hansen for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, forgive, I forgive him when he come to Lee, but um, up until then, I never forgive him. But yeah, one of them tattles from, from behind. Wigan were, we've always like gone in and took the legs. and Steph had to go off and we ended up playing Lee Brees at full back. We had no Joe Monaghan. We had forwards playing long minutes and it you could just see that we were getting tired and it weren't it weren't, weren't gonna happen. So bitterly disappointed, you know, because we got there the year before against Leeds as well. That was disappointing. You know, to go there twice and not win it's when you've worked hard all year, that's what all your pre seasons for to get to you know your grand finals and just come up short, it's it's a bitter pill to swallow, but I said, again, them are, the, them are the tough parts in sport that you've got to dust yourself off and, you know, make you more determined and, you know, there's going to be one winner at times. Why do you think it's never worked for Wellington in the grand final? Because obviously you mentioned the loss to Leeds, lost to Wigan and again, the defeats against Wigan as well. Um, why do you think it's just never happened for Wellington at Old Trafford? Um, me looking in, I think it's pressure. I do. I think. I think it's the pressure of, of winning it. I think if Warrington win one, they'll probably go on and win several more. I do. I just think it's that pressure of like in front, and you know, certainly with the players we had, it, it shouldn't have been an issue. Certainly when I was playing, it shouldn't have been an issue. You know, we, we were good enough as teams to get leads and defend our well, not defend our leads, but go on to win them games and be good enough. And then when I'm an outsider looking in, watching a few of the grand finals, it, it looks like they're under pressure, like. Maybe lads not doing something they don't normally do. You know, them games about all year doing what you do good is do it again. Don't try and do anything out of the ordinary. That comes on the back of doing your good stuff. So, I know it just looked like pressure to me. I think 
as soon as they get that win, it, you probably see that they'll go on and probably win more. You kind of can very out to obviously you said you're a Liverpool fan as well, but Liverpool like winning the Premier League, you think once they win one they'll go on and win a couple more. Do you think that's what they'll kind of be like worrying to because it's that long of a way since the league win? Yeah, I think so, yeah, I do. Probably similar to the challenge cup where like we we brought that voodoo and we went on to win it three times in four seasons, you know, and they've won it again they won it again last year. So, you know, the you do associate Warrington now with the Challenge Cup and before that they've not won it for years and years. So I think they could I think Warrington probably as a club now will, will be aiming making that a big massive goal for them to you know to win Super League. I think it'll be number one priority for them. And obviously you were coached by Tony Smith as well. What was Tony like as a coach for you at Warrington? Yeah, he were he just come in and you probably probably looking at how it changed, you probably think he came in and changed absolutely everything. He, he didn't change a lot to be honest at all. He just probably changed more like players' mentalities and you know, and probably put more pressure on as a player, like more ownership, like you know, like to be a bit more accountable. Probably were no disrespect. Some lads over the years of Warrington probably got away with stuff, you know, and kind of that swept under the carpet. But like, you know, all right, fair enough. But you know, no matter who you were, if you weren't performing under Tony or you did something wrong, you, you know, you knew about it, and you just had that something about him that made you want to perform better. And you know, he, he was it was particularly hard on me to be honest, but in a, in a good way. We had we had a laugh with it as well, you know, and you knew we could took the mickey out to me and I kind of took the mickey out of him and he gave me a bit of a rough ride but he knew I think he knew I responded to it and that's how he he knew he couldn't do that with everybody and that's probably where he was good his man management where he could he knew he could do that with me but with somebody else he couldn't do that because he knew the the red, would pro- the red would probably fall off so yeah he, um, Tony were good he come in and just add subtleties each year you know didn't come in and change teams massively brought two or three in might bring three players in the year after Really, really good coach and just changed that real philosophy at Warrington now. Probably, you know, made them that more professional outfit. What were your thoughts on the training facilities? Well, obviously, at the university, it's the Padgate campus. As being a former student there myself, I've seen like the players in the training facilities. What's it like to be at a training club where like, you are sharing it with university students? Yeah, a, bit, a little bit of first one, first year school, a bit like... You know, did feel quite your own, but um, I think as the years went on, they built they built the big gym at the side for us, and then they built the indoor dome as well. We had our own change room straight across the road. They gave that to us. I think it then it felt more like home, and you know, there's probably not many, not many more Super League clubs that have got better facilities or rugby clubs got better facilities than that now. And everybody was dead good around the campus. All the staff, you know, we another thing Tony was big on was like, you know, your manners and respect around the place, you know, because we ate inside the the canteen most times. And you know we were we were a well respected bunch. We always you know put our plates away and just little things said hello. You know old door opening doors for people because there's other people there as well. So yeah, you, I think that helped towards being a successful team, doing your your little good habits away from rugby as well as when you're at rugby. So yeah, I enjoyed it. Padgate again, it, it worked too far away, but had a brilliant setup. We had grass, then we got the indoor, you know, a little bit of running track inside, great weight, great gym facility. So yeah, you, um, really enjoyed it though. Do you think obviously like having a club like Warrington who are fighting near the top as well? Because university, you come from all over the country, don't you? Do you think that kind of helped bring in the crowd? I wanted to think about these students get a chance to see what it's like to have a professional sports team right on the doorstep, and it's only yeah, a minute well, drive yeah. to the game. I think so, yeah. Because you know, I kind of feel the students now and again. I like, always set up all right, and you know, this and that. You can see them watching when we're training now and again. So, <clears throat> a probably good excuse for them watching them rugby go and get. Go and get trolled after, you know, around Warrington. So yeah, because <laughs> they're not, you know, they've got a good support now. Like, again, started building up because they're always thereabouts now. It's, you know, it does attract people back. Let's go back now to May 2015. I think you know what I'm going to talk about again. Another Mickey Iron transfer saga this time. It's your old club that comes knocking. Derek Beaumont took over the reins at the lease and trains. We've just brought Gareth Hopkins. We just beat Salford in the Challenge Cup. And he comes knocking and says, Mickey, we want you back at Lee, we want you to push to Super League. Was it Derek that first got in touch with you or was it your agent saying that Lee are interested in wanting your services straight away? Yeah, it was my agent. He said he'd been on. He said, no, Lee have shown some interest. They want to try and get you in as soon as. And um, <clears throat> Obviously, I kind of just let the agent kind of see what 
I feel right to be. I think Tony Smith got wind of it and he pulled me in. Like I said, yeah, I've heard. You know, I have heard. Layer after me, this and that. And again, Tony just said, well, your contract will end it. Yeah, you're not going anywhere. And like, obviously, I'd just been given like the letter at the Warrington that because you're out of contract, you're free to negotiate with anybody else. Obviously, Lee wanted wanted to sign me like you know there and then really for, for the for the second half of the, that season. But, um, so yeah, it was a tough decision really. As much as it was the, as much as it was an easy decision going back home to Lee, it was a tough decision to leave Warrington because at the time you know I was still there. We were. You know, we still had a good squad there, and we still felt like, I still felt I could have done something there. But um, it was just, I think, when Lee showed the real interest and come knocking, I, I just said to Tony, I said, I don't feel I can turn this down, mate. I've got potentially two and a half seasons rugby still. But what what Tony didn't tell me, and what a lot of people probably didn't see at the time, was that like he weren't going to offer me another contract at Warrington, Tony. But you know, he didn't have to tell people that. But people just. Originally, a lot of people, certainly Warrington people, thought I'd just said, oh, I'm, I'm jumping ship, I'm going. So it was a little bit disappointing how a few Warrington people thought I kind of done a bad thing, and I didn't, to be honest with you. I, just, I was honest with Tony at the time and got quite upset, really, and emotional about it, chatting with him. It were because, you know, he, he said, I do get I get all that. You want to go back to Lee, you're a Lee lad, I get that. I said, but, you know, I can't just let you go now, halfway through the season. I said, well, if that don't happen, Tony, then there won't be a deal for me because Warrington needed somebody then. So it kind of it kind of ended up getting a little bit nasty, to be honest. And nothing, I didn't want it to happen like that. But it was probably only, only the way the the deal could have got done was kind of getting a bit at loggerheads, and it, it was upsetting really because of you know how to leave the Tony and Warrington at that time. It was it was upsetting and tough, but I couldn't I couldn't turn Lee down when they come back. So you obviously, like you said, you mentioned it didn't end on the best of circumstances with Warrington. But the thing that I think people are forgetting as well is you were still playing regularly in that Warrington team as well. You were still, you were kind of helping Daryl Clark nurture the game because he'd just come from Castleford as well. And I think a lot of people when they looked at it thought, oh yeah, he's not really playing for Warrington. It's kind of smart for him to go back to But you were constantly playing some good rugby, weren't you, at that time at Warrington? Yeah. I think that's why we came in for you. Yeah, yeah. You know, Daryl will come from Cass on the back of his Man of Steel award at Cass and I end up starting games and Daryl coming on and, you know, like he'd, like he'd done for Cass. So we were kind of forming a decent partnership there and, and obviously it was nice that I could kind of, you know, give a little bit, you know, advice to him as well and, you know, me, me off him as well. So, you know, it's, it's not as though like I were throwing my, my toys out the pram because I, I weren't playing and stuff. I was regular every, you know, every, every playing every week and playing well. I was still in good form, but... And that's another reason why I wanted to potentially go to Lee. I didn't want to go to Lee and just in the back, real back end of my career, and just pick up some money and, and not perform well. You know, that's not what I'm about. So that's another reason that made it <clears throat> all more difficult that I wanted to go. So I wanted to play some good rugby and you know help push get back in Super League, which obviously eventually we did. And your first game back for Lee wasn't at Lee. It wasn't at Lee. It was at a neutral ground in the summer bash against Feverston Rovers at Blackpool. At- Black Bluefield Road in Blackpool, so again, it's another like a stadium game for you, and yeah. that was a, a nickel game, wasn't it, Mickey? There was a lot yeah, of yeah, yeah. things yeah. happening in that. Sat on bench, it was just like a fighter thon. I was like, "What's going on here?" <laughs> like two pub teams just going at it. But yeah, obviously, Featherstone Lee was massive rivalry in that, and still is in that in division. You know, two of the biggest clubs in Championship. So um, yeah, I, f- I remember coming on, and it was like everybody were fired up. I was like, "Wow, it's." I remember, but I remember that week Paul Rowley said to me when I, when I come over he just said just don't underestimate this league you know prepare yourself it's, it's tough and physical and yeah he worked wrong in that respect it was um, it was a tough old game that and it kind of took me by surprise to be honest but anyway managed to get the job done and you know it went on from there A debut try as well a second debut I should say try for yourself as well and one of your old mates as well, Paul Ward, who got sent off, didn't he? He's also famous to that yeah. Did you wind him up about it afterwards? Yeah, I remember speaking to him after that. Like, he just said, ah, I just, you know, he, he got accused of doing, he got accused of gouging Bob uh, Bezik and he, he just claimed, he said, I did, I did not gouge him, or if I did, it was totally accidental, I didn't mean to, but obviously he got, he got the red card and but made our made job that little easier, but if ever a good side at the time, you know, they had Gaz Carvel, Woody, they had Renner two with her, you know, they still had some good players. Obviously, Renny later come on to us the year after. But yeah, it was, um, it was, a, it was an eye-opener, eye that game. It, it realised how physical it was. 
And then as fate would have it, after Lee beat Salford and came back against Wakefield in the Challenge Cup, the draw showed that Lee had Warrington Wolves at the Hollywell Jones Stadium. Now, I've heard a rumour, I want to clear this up. Was there a clause in your contract when you first joined that you couldn't play against Warrington in that cup game? Yeah, I think they put that in, yeah. Yeah. I remember, um, I remember, I'd, I don't think, I think I'd just signed prior to him going to Wakefield and winning. I remember watching it on BBC because it was, it was a Sunday afternoon game, wasn't it? Wakefield, yeah, the right. cup. And it, fantastic game. And I was just, uh, my mum was at our house with Kate and the kids and I was just, um, I was just vanishing some internal doors. And I said, oh, just let us know when draw comes on. So anyway, I'm playing, do you know what's coming on? I said, and I said to, I remember saying to Kate, I said, about any money, we'll get Warrington. So anyway, my mum's off coaching, Kate, and I'm um, just painting those next night. I hear this almighty scream. Honestly, my, my stomach dropped. I had pain rush. I went, I, went, I know what you're going to say. I said, we've got Warrington away. She went, yeah, you're right. I was like, wow. I couldn't write it. I couldn't, and I thought, right, so, but then I, I, a little bit inside time before, I want to play here. I know Derek, Derek were trying to find ways that we couldn't try and play, but obviously the, the clause had been put in, so it would have been a hefty fine if it had played or just, I don't know what had happened, so it was kind of, I was water boy for the day, but um, I thought, Lee, they were brilliant that day, Lee, they were brilliant, Took a bit of individual brilliance from a couple of tries for Warrington, was the only difference I thought, but um, yeah. Do you remember the response you got from like, the Warrington staff and the fans that day when you came on, I'm guessing, I mean I was there that day, but you kind of focused on your own team. What was it like from a Warrington standpoint whenever you used to see it? And I remember Lee Breeze was probably playing more than many of the players did because he was on the pitch that often, wasn't he? I know he was, yeah. To be fair, all the, the um, Warrington fans outside before the game and that, they were like, they were dead welcoming him, you know, sad to see you go, blah, blah, blah. They were, yeah, they, they were good. I think, I'd like to think because they, re, they knew that I always tried to give me all when I played for Warrington, you know, I didn't, I didn't always play the best, but at least I always tried my best, you know, so I think a lot of people are pretty, Appreciate when you, you know, when you put your effort in, you, you know, it's it's hard not to to criticise you too much. So yeah, they were they were got a decent reception. It was it was it was nice, really. And then from there, it was the start. Obviously, the formats is the middle eights with Lee in with other teams from the Championship and Super League as well. And in the first game, we took a healthy half-time lead against OKR. We lose that game in the second half, and then it all kind of went downhill. Then what happened in the middle eights, Mickey? Because it Everyone was saying that Lee were going to go up that year. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I just think sometimes you, from my personal experiences, come playoff times, in, certainly when we're in Super League, I think your mentality shouldn't say not change, but like sometimes might shift that you've got to you've got to know when to just rein that final pass in and maybe kick a ball and find touch or drop down, take your tackle and go again on the next one or whatever. And, I think we trill, you know, we, we played a brilliant, brilliant brand of rugby, don't get me wrong, it was great to play in that kind of style of rugby because it suited how I like to play, but against probably better defensive teams in Super League who've, you know, playing, no disrespect, better opposition every week, you can't always do that, and I think we tried it too much sometimes, end up coming up with errors and, and conceding tries off the back of it, so, yeah, we just probably, not, once they got found out a little bit, but we just probably didn't, as a Certainly, as players at the time, probably didn't say, right, let's go back to basics here and get a kick and, you know, get some momentum back in the game. We kind of still try to shift the ball. And you you know what it's like if you're trying to shift the ball when you're on the back foot. It's difficult. You know, you need to be in your front foot going forward first. And, <clears throat> yeah, just a couple of things didn't go our way. And, and, I, and then I think, as I so, said, probably not used to losing. It was a tough one to take. And we were pretty flat after the KR game. And then we did kind of... We didn't manage to recover other than the um, the Sheffield where we won comfortably, but when it came against the Super League opposition, we were we just got come un, un, unstuck a little bit, got found out. So it was it, it, bitterly disappointing because it'd been nice for go up that year. It'd have been brilliant, but not to be. And do you find sometimes as well, like because Lee had only lost one league game all season as well, they lost in the Challenge Cup. Do you think, like, obviously we've got the mentality if you've got a lead now, we know, like, you kind of think team recommend you're ever going to win and you, you don't kind of suffer the consequences. And do you think also sometimes maybe not losing in so long kind of has a negative effect of when you do lose that first game because it's not a known for the rest of the season? Yeah, it could be. It could be. But, um, say, good, good, you know, 
what probably makes good teams great is that they bounce back from that, you know, and don't let it happen again. And we just didn't quite do that. So it's, <coughs> yeah, possibly not used to losing. And then, you know, all the teams then kind of, another team coming the week after, you know, try and go for that and, you know, push on the back of that. Well, you know, Lee had lost one day. They're not used to that. We'd probably end up feeling a little bit sorry for ourselves, you know, and, you know, probably trying too hard then when things aren't going your way and you end up making more mistakes. So, yeah, it was, it was a, Bitter end, really, to what had been a brilliant season. And it was um, a real harsh learning curve. And obviously, the year after, we kind of we learned some lessons and we went one better. And um, just talk about 2016 then. Rangi Chase, Corey Patterson, Harris Nansen, your old mate, came back into the club. Um, but on, I think it was like literally two or three days before the start of the season, after we just lost to Wellington in the pre season at Hellwell Jones, Paul Rowley leaves the club. What was your thoughts on what happened then with Paul? Do you remember? Kind of what was happening that day? Did you hear about it in training? Did he come and tell you he was he's quit, or what happened on that day? Well, yeah, we were um, self captain. Um, Harrison was a, Harrison was vice, and um, I can't think who else do we? I think it was player. Corey, was it as well? Corey, 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 yeah, yeah. He just said, "We're well, lads. We just coming to the office." So I said, "Yeah, what's up?" He just said, uh, "I just said, listen, I'm, 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 I'm resigning." I said, "Ah." Said no, don't be daft. You know, we were we were proper like, is he joking here? Or what? We were like, we, we tried our best to persuade him not to not to leave at the time rolls, but um, he he just said, listen, there's just too many things, and you know, it's I'm not enjoying it, this and that, and you know, I'm not going to detail what he actually said because it's you know it's not for me to to spread the light. But he, he just he just found he'd, he'd like got to a point where he, he weren't kind of enjoying it and stuff. You know, a couple of battles he were facing and stuff. It were. It was difficult, so he just said, "Listen, I'm, I, I don't need this now. I'm, I want to. I'm leaving it. So I'm, but you know, I'm, I'm leaving it over to Dukes here, and Dukes do a fine job. So, yeah, it was a bit of a weird, weird week that week. You know, it was tough. Real out of the blue surprise because we'd had a brilliant pre-season week in um, Lanzarote. I know we got a bit of a scoreline blew up at Warrington, but there was a good feel about it. You know, we knew we had a we we're on for a, a good year, and. To be fair, we didn't we didn't let it affect us all year. Apart from the, the first week at Batley, where we did get beaten, you know, we beat ourselves that day. You know, I, I don't think we should have lost the game all year, but um, yeah, it was a funny all week. We lost to Batley, thinking, "Christ, is it going to be? Is it all gone downhill from here after what's happened?" But then we we turned it around quick, and we, we ended up having a, a fantastic year. Do you think what happened with Paul kind of was playing on everyone's mind to come back the game against Batley as well? I mean, even on the Duke's mind as well because he was. Paul Rowley was a long-time assistant and he was taking over the reins. Do you think it was on everybody's mind still that this is still fresh and it was just kind of played out against Batley? Because all the media hype then, it happened, didn't it, when Lee lost and everyone was yeah. kind of jumping on that bandwagon then, wouldn't we have Lee bottling it again? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, I think, I think it did have an effect, no doubt about it. And you could see by the reaction at the end of the game when Batley won, you think they'd won the cup final because that's how much it meant to turn us over. So yeah, it kind of... It could have gone either way. Well, teams capitalised on that, and we were, you know, teams were giving it to us. But to be fair, we rallied round the week after, and we had a good sit down, a good chat, and train well. And you know, we, we, we kind of went from there and ended up on a, you know, on a, on a brilliant run. And then you get to the middle eights again, and all of a sudden, all the mistakes from last year kind of were righted and lead with a team that looks like they did the job. Albeit, they probably thought it was going to happen last year, but this that year. You just went for it, didn't you? And it was relentless from the Lee team that middle eight. Yeah, yeah. No, we let's get a bit. I'm when you said about like confidence when you're winning games. We 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 went into the middle eight in, in brilliant form, playing brilliant rugby, and I thought we got the blend right of knowing when to kick sets out, when to play. You know, put 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 teams to bed, and you know, to our credit, we, we carried that against Super League. I thought against Salford. I know they scored a couple of late tries to make it close than it was. But I thought, you know, we thought we played brilliant against them. And I think the OKR game away was a fantastic game for us. We really showed some real great, because no matter how well OKR playing, to go there on a Sunday afternoon, certainly hammering down the rain as well. There's not many teams go there, I'm telling you, to play like we did. And <clears throat> again, I think from that moment when we won that game, I, th I think we knew that we were, we had one foot in into Super League and it was just a, probably a matter of time. And 
to the first 40 minutes the week after against Huddersfield where I don't think we could have played any better and again credit to Huddersfield they, they come back and give it us but I think we'd switched off then you know we certainly switched off to concede that many points was disappointing but we got the job done we, got, we did what we needed to do and you know we, we got to the Holy Grail albeit you know not long enough for, for my liking but we got the just looking on that whole KR game as well, obviously, if whole KR starts off that game well, but once they managed to get back into the game, I think it was Sam Hopkins who scored the first try. Once Sam scored that, it was all a case of it was Lee now who was trying to push forward. And was there a point in that game where you thought, we've got this here now? Was there, I think, I can't remember, I think it was Drinkwater's try, put us two tries. What do you think? Yeah. Like, that was it now. Yeah, I think I'd come off at the time I was on the bench, and I remember. Um, Drinky dropped Corey off and Corey went straight through and gave it back to him and when he scored I just thought I think it's going to be our day this and then obviously come back on later in the game and I think we had a drop goal effort I'm not sure one before and I remember getting the ball and I pinged it back to Riddy and he knocked it over and you know it's we we knew that was definitely our you know fate was sick and he knocked it over that was when we knew it was um it was definitely done. So, um, say it's one of my favourite pitches when, I, when I'm running back with my fist pumped and Riddy's like shouting yes. It was a um, special moment that. Finally, you know, especially two Lee lads knowing that we're, we're, almost, we're almost in Super League. So, yeah, um, brilliant day of that. And how, how good was Riddy in the middle? Eh? It's because a lot, I think he was the one who wanted to prove a lot of people wrong by saying he's not going to be a Super League quality player and he kind of proved himself wrong that day. And I remember the pictures as well, like celebrating with the fans at full time as well. There's some very famous pictures if you were a Lee fan from that day as well. And I think that's when the fans started to dream, didn't they? As well, that, that Super League dream was becoming a reality again. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, really, really was, he was, he was magnificent in the middle eights. He was brilliant. Scored some fantastic tries. You know, got his, got us around the park. He, were, he, uh, he really showed his quality. And so it's just a shame he didn't get... He didn't get long in Super League, you know, to adapt to it and, you know, get used to the, the pace and, you know, the, the different aspects to it. It's, um, you know, because he surely, surely should have had a bit more of a crack at it. But, you know, it's one of them things. It, was, it, it, it didn't happen and, you know, he's, he can't, you know, it doesn't happen to everybody. You've got to move on and do what you can. So, yeah, no, it was brilliant. It was brilliant that we got in the middle eights and so it's, um, it's just a shame we didn't stay there long enough, too, or longer. I'd like to ask you about your dancing as well after that Huddersfield game. I think the Sky Cameras caught it perfectly. Was that just a spur of the emotion thing? Have you finally done it? And yeah, it, 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 about? What it was, it was bloody um, Dukes <laughs> round the camera and he just pushed me into the middle. He said, go on. I'm like, what, what do I do here? I'm like, just think, <laughs> just trying to think of something coming to my head. So yeah, he didn't give me, he didn't give me any prior warning. So I thought the circumstance said it all right, but it don't look great on telly. But I won't bother because <clears throat> we, you know, we got the job done. And what was the difference between Dukesy and Paul Rowley as coaches? Obviously, two different kind of coaches. What was your thoughts on the differences between Neil Dukes and Paul Rowley, and why it worked for Dukes when they didn't for Rowley? Um, I don't know. To be honest, because like Dukesy, probably he still took quite a bit off what Rosa did. He did. Again, he didn't change too much. He just kind of put his just put his little bit of stamp on, you know, how, how he wanted to play. It. So um, probably had a little bit more. Probably a little bit more structure under Dukes, eh? <clears throat> you know, a bit more. No one to no one to get to your sets and kick, and then maybe no one to shift. Where Rose love, you know, Rose love playing, <clears throat> you know, all across the park. So yeah, there's probably a little bit more steadiness about us that year. But again, I think obviously Rose, who we brought in that year as well. I think we added some more quality again that year. So that have helped. That helped anyway, you know. So probably not as much. The coach, and I think that the, the playing staff we had in as well could manage games during games as well. You know, like myself and Harrison and a few more drinky. You know, we kind of we could chat amongst ourselves. Right, let's get to our kick on this next set. You know, we probably didn't need we didn't need you see hammering messages down all the time. So we kind of we had a team that kind of well, not I won't say coach itself, but certainly helped helped you along that along that way as well. And then you get to Super League, obviously we lose the first two games. The Castleford game was the year that Castleford got to the grand final and they were an outstanding team that year. It was some good off the couple with it. Lee were probably used to playing as well. And then we get to the first home game and you leave the lads out for the first time at Lee Sports Village as captain in the Super League. What was that moment like for you, especially against a team like the Leeds Rhinos as well? 
Yeah, yeah, it's again, it's one of your being a Lee lad and watching Lee from a kid, it was it was a dream come true to you know to lead him out and you know, just always grateful that I got that chance to lead Lee out in Super League and it's a, it's a moment I'll never forget and obviously, you know, again we were I think we were a we we're a shit grabbing a pass off off winning that game in the corner. I thought I thought again we were certainly if we weren't the better team, we were certainly <laughs> a draw them in a fair result minimum. So it were yeah, it were a bitter pill to swallow that first one, but then um so we had a, we had a decent run early on in the year, you know, we we, we we turned up some really good teams in New Warrington, St. Helens, Huddersfield, Salfords. You know, we 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 we're, we're in some good form. It were, and it just kinda again, just well just that bit of quality when you know your good super league teams, regular teams get used to get the foot in and get used to speed and they start playing well and we kinda just couldn't quite live with it at times. So, you know, again we had some injuries. I think they cost us some injuries we had throughout the year, disruptive. But um, you know, we, we didn't come bottom of the league. You know, we, we finished above witness. But at the end of the day, Super League at the time was you're into your mid lights and all that. So it was a a new competition, and we probably went into that in in really bad form. And again, we, we, we I thought we'd done enough to be honest. I thought we'd done enough, but just a couple of results didn't quite get us there. And you know, Catalan at home in the million pound game. Um, I thought we had some tough calls in that game. I thought I thought real. Some real calls in that game swung the game in Catalan's momentum. For me, it looked like they didn't want Catalan's to go down, but you know, it might just look like that from my point of view. I thought, uh, I won't say we got cheated out of that, but there was influences that made it um, difficult for us to win. But I thought we, our effort was unbelievable, but um, a couple of calls I thought were were horrendous. But you know, that's that sport. And then, obviously, like you said about the million pound game and everything, you didn't think that. We should at least didn't get the right calls at the end of the day, but like you said, you got to deal with what is sport. But the main talking point after that was your future, and it was announced. I think it was a couple of months afterwards that you had retired. Now I've spoke to you about this previously. We've had chats about it. So, but for people yeah. who haven't heard this story before, you weren't ready to retire then, were you? In two thousand and eighteen. No, no, it wasn't. No, no, and anybody ever asked me, I said no, and I kind of probably. I put the club before myself and you know whether that's the right or wrong thing to do people have different opinions on that and I kind of for the sake of the club and obviously I got what I got told off Dukesy whether Kieran Cunningham as well had influence in it which he probably did I got told that if I wanted to keep playing I'd, with, with the players they're bringing in I'd probably be, um, I'd probably be fourth Chai Sucker and um, I just thought I, I were insulted to be honest I were, yeah. I were disgusted how they, how, they sport, how they treated me and a little bit, and you know, probably probably anybody else who weren't from, if you weren't from Lee, you'd have probably just said "f off" and you know, and moved on and left. And but being a Lee lad, and you know, Lee does something to you, it pulls you in there. I kind of, I kind of agree what they did and said they're right, fair enough that I retire and you know have some kind of a role in the community and a bit of coaching. But it, it, I weren't happy, but I did it because probably me being a decent lad and loving the club, you know, I, I made the decision and. So from when I, game days, the first six, seven games that the, when they were playing, I was on the touchline and the, I could just see how like flat the lads were and how like down they were and they weren't winning games and teams were like, yeah, you know, we went to Barrow and got turned over and Toulouse come back in like scored some like twenty odd unanswered points and it was, it was tough to watch being a lead lad who still had that passion to play and it was killing me to be honest, it was killing me inside. It was, but. Um, I made I made the decision and what well, Lee, Lee made the decision that they didn't want me to play and it, 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 it was tough watching and helping out because I still felt I could have whether well, not as much with the legs running around with that little bit of leadership and you know experience you know being a lad who's you know been there done it and knows what Lee's about because we had a lot of new players that year you know quite a few Aussies were over and probably not quite sure what what Lee was about at the time obviously they lost the game Dukes resigned and Kieran Purcell come in and um, I just said to Kieran Pearl on the day he got the job I said listen mate what are you doing coaching wise I'd love to move up and go full time with you he said he said no mate I'm not going to do that he said I'm going to take everything on myself at the moment I've just got Andor um, so I just said to him I said well Wayne, uh, Wayfield Wildcats have been on Chris Chester and I'm going to I said if you don't want me to 
take a roll on at Lee, I'm going to go and sign for, Aldrich was going to get in the car and go to Wakefield and sign for them for the rest of that year and a year after, because he just, because he wanted an experience nine. He said, I've spoke to a few of the lads, um, uh, Fafitu, Grixie and all them, they'd, they'd love to have you on board. You know what you've done and that. So I said, right. So I said to Kieran, I said, I'm going to go there. So just as I'm going to put the phone down, Kieran said, well, I want you to come back and play for us. So I said, right, you bastard. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just I said to Chris Chester, like, he, he didn't offer me anything concrete. So I just said to Chris, listen, I've been offered a concrete deal from Lee for, you know, this year. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 37 now, nearly 38. I'll, I'm going to have to probably take that. So I think Chester were a bit disappointed, but he didn't, there weren't actually anything in concrete there. I'm kind of, I'm, we're going up to, you know, negotiate and stuff, whatever, but obviously the travelling that at that age, travelling on my own or whatever, you know, it made sense to go back to Lee and as soon as Kieran asked me, I said, yeah, yeah, I'd love to, mate. So, yeah, went back playing and I'd like to think kind of a bit of an influence that year. We went back into, you know, onto a brilliant run, winning run again and just didn't quite come up. I think we just failed by a point not to make. I think it was the Austin the Bash game, wasn't it, where yeah. Andy decided it. Yeah, the kick, that kick went over, I don't care what you say. I agree with you on that one. I mean, I wanted to ask you this as well, um, you talked about Juicy when he resigned and Kim Cunningham was up there then. Do you think maybe Juicy was in the job for too long and what was your thoughts on Kim Cunningham at Lee? Because it would be interesting to hear what your thoughts were on him on his time at Lee. Um, I won't say so much Juicy was there for too long. I just thought, I just think Juicy, me knowing Juicy what he's like, because he's a nice bloke, Juicy. He's a great bloke. And I just think, I just think he let other people possibly have a say over him because technically he was still the head coach at the time. He should have had the final say. You know, I remember speaking to Dukes about like when he when he resigned with me and that. He just said, "I wish." He just said, "I wish I'd have, um, I wish I'd have kept you on." And I thought, well, you know, you you could have kept me on if you wanted to. You know what I mean? It was like whether he kind of took it from other people, and you know, sometimes at being head coach, you've got to make decisions that you know finally is your decision whether you, your staff don't like it or whatever. So I remember him saying that. But yeah, I just don't. I don't know with Kieran Cunningham. I kind of he come in on that middle eight back end of Super League and to me I just thought well he'll, he'll try and help us stay up in Super League if he does then you know potentially might have something there and you know we, we didn't see it we got relegated and he got a he landed a, a two year deal or whatever it were and I'm like and I'm assuming maybe Kieran probably had some influence on me not not playing you know obviously his, his son come in and he looked at other nines who were probably younger and you know fresher or whatever than me but yeah, it was disappointing knowing knowing Kieran a long time, and I thought he might have wanted me to stay around Lee playing, you know, being a, an experienced head. So yeah, and I'll never know the reason why they did it and that, but yeah, I don't think at the time I don't think we needed Kieran Cunningham to be honest, coming full time. We still had Kieran Pertley, who I rate Isla. You know, we had Dukes there, we had Andor. I think we still had Paul Cook at the time. You know, we had, we had I don't know if he'd left. I don't know, but we still had well enough staff and. Don't know, sometimes you have too many cooks that can spoil the broth, can't they? Whether well, it was a case of that at that time, yeah, I don't know. But um, it is what it is, and, you know, it's, it's moved on now, and it? So it certainly didn't work for us at the time. How hard were them, well, there was the middle eights, it was the Championship Shield. How hard were them games to get yourself motivated? Because all the squad, that's what got disbanded to a lot of people, don't forget. Also, it's like we got to a point where it was literally down to the bare bones. How hard was it? to cope with that middle eight well that qualifying because it just felt like you were playing games out of necessity and then it got to a point it was due to be away and we had no subs and surely you've got oh. to look at that and think why did we let that game go ahead without any subs no it, it was um, it was a day like in my rugby career where and as a lead lad that I think I'd hit, I'd hit rock bottom that day at Jews, but it were, um, it were awful to see the club where we were at couldn't field you know a full squad Going to Jews being absolutely trounced, and you know, to be fair, the fans were still there. I can only probably only shining light they were. Then fans were, were there till the end, and it was a sad day for rugby, certainly for Lee rugby. And it, it was like, wow, is this is this how it's going to end as a club and everything? Career, it were um, it was a sad, sad time, and it was a worrying time. That like, you know, my, my dreams and aspiration coming back to Lee to you know play and finish, and then move on to the coaching staff and be a part of hopefully a successful coaching career and it were all just took underneath me from like that and 
a lot of just what, what am I going to do next? You know, I, I had the gym and stuff, you know, which was something I could push, but. So you mentioned the disappointment of the Dewsbury game and afterwards we played Featherston in the Championship Shield final, but with a makeshift team with low needs from Wigan and Saints. What were your thoughts after the Dewsbury game going into that Featherston final? Yeah, to be honest, I didn't even know whether whether we'd play it or what. It was just um, real, a real sad time for the club. You know, it just felt like um, the club were just crumbling before our feet, really. You know, and it, it had that feeling in the game as well. A couple of injuries, you know, um, down to 12, 11 men at one stage. And Jews, we were just like scoring at free will. And it was um, it was quite sad, really. Oh, Harry, oh, Harry, I'm just on a Zoom meeting. Yeah. Sorry, Matt. Sorry, no. It'll make it'll make to it a bit of that anyway. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, we're just like again, just just sheer deflation. Like I said yesterday, uh, the other day to you, like just I felt that like all kind of my dreams, aspirations of coming back to Lee, playing, finishing there, and you know, hopefully coaching there one day was like, taken from me really, and it was um. Real sad day, you know, I remember seeing Mike Laver and Mike was upset and made me upset of Kieran Pertle and the staff and a few of the lads. It was, um, yeah, it worked nice and then it was just kind of, I think the week leading to Featherson was potentially, you know, let's go and try and give it a go and finish on a high really. But again, I think the damage had already been done then. It was, I think it was too far gone. And then obviously we didn't know what was going to happen then with the club. We didn't know if there was going to be a team for next year. So, like you said, I think a lot of the lads were looking at life outside rugby league. Were you one of them who was thinking about what you're going to be doing in case there's no game to go back to next year? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, I thought, I'll be honest with you, I thought my, my league career, you know, playing my part at league was, was over, to be honest. So I kind of took the my PT business and my gym, tried to take that on full time. You know, I started advertising for you know, more work there and stuff and pushing that a bit. And then, because um, I thought, you know, because I thought that was the, you know, that was a fallback that, that one of the options he had. And if anything, coming rugby later down the track, you know, I'd, I'd cross that bridge when I come to it. But, um, yeah, so it was the gym that moved forward. And obviously, you know, I think Duff's, Duff's must have got the call or whatever happened with, with him at Featherston moving to Lee. And cause I think Featherston was similar similar situation to us. Obviously, the dust, dust left and he must have got wind of it. Oh, Derek with, with Lee and stuff. So, yeah, that's how that kind of uh, come on then. So, you just mentioned then John Duffy moved over from Featherston to Lee. Um, when was your first conversation with John and when did he give you the news that you were going to be playing for next year? Um, yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a few weekend, probably when teams were already, you know, back pre-season training. I was kind of... I'd, I'd heard rumours that... Um, you know, John Duffy might be being linked. I think there was other names as well. I can't remember who. We're trying to, you know, rebuild. But I'd, I'd, not, I'd not really heard nothing then. I think I got, I got a call one, it was one evening, I was in the gym or something. Oh, okay, I was at home and Duff's gave me a ring. He said, oh, you know, I think it's Duff's. Because I've known Duff's, I've known Duff's a long time, but never like, um, never exchanged phone numbers and been in his, you know, in his like, like with him and spent time with him a lot really. I've always seen him out and about whether it's uh, matches or out and up in a pub or anywhere like that. I've never been in his company for too long, but yeah, he just rang me. He just said, um, would you be interested in, you know, coming on board at Lee, helping me, um, you know, build the team and try and get Lee back to where I said, well, yeah, what, what, what kind of capacity do you want me? You know, because obviously I assumed my, my, my playing career was over. He said, well, I said, I still think you can do a year playing. I want you to do a job for me there. You know, experience said and all that. So I just got, so I just got a little bit of fire back in my belly. I said, yeah, yeah, I'd love to. You know, obviously, I knew that my body couldn't do what, you know, my legs have kind of not given up, but like not what they used to be. So I knew, I knew, you know, I was limited what I could do, but just that experience and, you know, an older head on the pitch, which I think, you know, I think you need in teams. I kind of, yeah, I got that passion back and, you know, I'm combined the roles of strength and goodness and player that se last season, you know, I really enjoyed it. And then pre season was probably a lot different to what you know, normally have with your professional club's career as well. It looked like t players were coming in, kits from the old teams and there was a picture, I think it was on one of the hills at the Christmas run, you were all dressed up in your Christmas stuff and but I think we used to say like a gang of misfits because nobody really wanted some of these players that came to league but you managed to pull together and then shocked the whole rugby league world on the first game of the season when you beat Toulouse at home. What was all that experience like for you? Yeah, it was, uh, it was different obviously because I kind of 
I was kind of um, strength and conditioning, so I was kind of more planning sessions and you know I do I do all the rugby based stuff, but I weren't really doing all the running and you know the tough stuff, which you know I've always enjoyed doing. But so I kind of didn't do it. But to be fair, the lads who come in at the time, I think we just, you know our first training session might have had about 12, 14 lads there. That were it. You know, just enough for a bit of you know, like a pause games, played a few games against each other, knew some skills. You know, it were like all like I said, all in their own training gear. It, it, it did look a bit like an amateur club, but um, to be fair, the, la- the lads all come in, wanted to play for Lee, we got on board, they were training hard. And then just as the weeks went on, we, you know, we gradually built built a squad, a few more come in. Obviously, we, we, we were well behind, anyway. we were probably four or five weeks behind every other club, certainly in our division and, you know, and teams around us. So we were always playing catch-up, so we kind of had to cram a lot in in months, you know, in a short space of time without... Probably like burning the lads out and you know getting injuries and stuff in, in training. To be fair, you know to be fair, they, they didn't do that. Uh, they all trained. They trained hard. Like them Saturday morning hill sessions. You know that I couldn't fault them at all. They were brilliant. And um, I said we, we had a, a pre Christmas uh, run up. I think it was Rivington and in our you know, like fancy Christmas gear. And it really brought us together. Like been a, what had been like a good tough tough month or so. And obviously then it you know it coincided with. Um, we got our first game at Toulouse and probably nobody expected us to win that game. You know, we had a couple of, couple of dual reg loan signings we sent, uh, from Saints. You know, Luke Douglas was unbelievable for us. He was brilliant. I wish we were, you know, could have had Luke probably this year as well. He'd have been brilliant as well for us. But, um, yeah, we played Toulouse. Nobody expected it. Just said, just go out there and, you know, I believe in you. I think we can do a job here anyway. We we turned out and, we, you know, I thought we, I thought we were unbelievable. We got him stuck into him. We gave it him. We got for, you know, I just result really. It was a convincing win. You mentioned then about Luke Douglas. Obviously, he swept the Player of the Year awards at the season just gone. Was there any other players who you were presently surprised by as well? Because obviously, you mentioned Luke Douglas was a player of NRL quarters. Is there anyone who maybe sits under radar you thought is a good player on our hands? Yeah, I really I didn't know. I played against him a couple of times, like in the last few years, like Toby Adamson. I thought Toby were brilliant for us. You know, um, you know, obviously, you know, he looks after himself. You know, with the business he has, obviously he eats healthy and stuff and he's in good shape. And, you know, I kind of always oh, known about to play against his brother a lot of years. Luke as well, you know, Luke was good for us. Toby, I thought Toby really stood out. He was, excuse me, fantastic. He had a real strong year. Um, who else? I don't know. All across the board, really, because I don't think we, we didn't know what to expect. You know, you know Ian Thornley made the made the drop down and I think he might have been shocked by the physicality of the championship early on and you know when, I think when Ian found his straps he was um, he was brilliant for us um, but yeah it was um, it was a real I don't know just a real nice um, year to finish off you know like no expectations built a squad in a short space of time gradually added to it and, and probably overachieved really it was a brilliant year yeah you mentioned then a brilliant year and one of the highlights must have been going back to Blackpool and the Bash against the Windus Vikings and last game on a Sunday in front of a packed stand it felt like we were playing at home with the support that we had from the crowd that day in front of the Sky cameras as well saving one of the best performances of the season for that game as well what was your thoughts on that day? Yeah a brilliant day I, I love the Summer Bash you know, I've, I've, you know I've played in Magic Weekends which I think are brilliant and I think the Summer Bash for the Champions is brilliant as well it's a great concept it gives it gives fans, you know, weekends out or days out or whatever. And I think it gives your players, certainly lads who, you know, no disrespect, have not played, say, in, in finals and big, bigger games. It, that, it gives that bit of a final feel. So it's a chance of playing, you know, in a good stadium, big crowd. You know, and I thought our game was um, a real fitting end to what, what was a good weekend. Um, cracking game. I think we're, you know, we're, we were more than good for our win. Witness had periods where they come back into it, but I thought, I thought we were good. You know, and I said a crowd again. You know, I think... I think, I don't know, it just seemed to Lee and Summer Bash just have something that goes together, really. You know, we've, um, it's always been um, some good game, always been fiery, you know, thrilling games every time we've played at Summer Bash for Lee. So it's, um, no, it's, it was, it's brilliant. And do you think as well, playing in a local derby and them kind of Summer Bash games heats up the atmosphere as well? Obviously, Winners being Lee's closest rivals in the Championship in terms of geography and probably history as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I... I um I think early, early on in the year it might have been Good Friday. Um, I got rested for that game, obviously because of the short turnarounds. And um, I don't think 
a lot of the lads realise how big of a, a derby Lee witness is now. Because when we went to win this, I thought they got the better. Well, they didn't get the better of us. They, they give it to us. They wanted it more. And I think when it when we come to this one, and I think we kind of bigged it up for like you know I think Dust wanted me to say a few words about what what it you know what it meant to leave me witness. Because I remember when I first played my first debut, you know, back in two thousand nine nine two thousand, we played witness. It was a massive game. Then Lee witness, always a massive game, and maybe a few lads didn't quite realise that. You know, it was quite a big game and soon did, you know, so, it, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's coming to a real good rivalry now and it's um, just a shame we didn't get a chance to play it at Good Friday this year. Looking forward to that one. Yeah, obviously, obviously with all this going on, we don't know when, when that rivalry will resume, but looking ahead to a game that maybe doesn't hold as much fond memories against Windus was the new competition that came in, the 1895 Cup. We drew them at least sports in the semi-final, but unfortunately, Windows got the better was that day. What do you think kind of went wrong for the lads? Do you think it was a pressure of maybe being favourites and getting a Wembley appearance on the board? Does that kind of heat pressure on players? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I think so. Maybe. And again, not being disrespectful, probably players that have not been been to the, you know them big games before. And to be honest, with the form that we were probably in and witness, of, you know, had a few difficulties. That they were going through some difficulty at the time. I think we thought we'd you know we'd do a job. We had the home tie. I think we thought we'd. Just need to turn up and play, and you know, and you, and you don't, you don't think like that, and you don't approach it like that. But I think subconsciously, sometimes you, you you have that in the back of the mind, and whether that Wembley, you know, eighty minutes away from Wembley, might have just got to us a little bit, which I think it did. Conditions, you know, conditions played a part, and I thought, um, I thought Witness played the, the wet weather conditions far better than us. They kicked better, and like I said, there weren't, there weren't many opportunities in that game, and they took them when they did. A bit of magic for him, I think it might have been Danny Craven as well. What was potentially the difference that day? You know, um, they scored, they scored a, to be fair, they scored a cracking try near the end to, to like win the game. I think Gelly might finish that try off, but to be fair, it was a, it was a fair try. But yeah, it just, it just wasn't our, wasn't our day. You know, it weren't through lack of effort. You know, our effort's always been there all last year. Just kind of probably not quite smart at times, whether just a bit of pressure. And, but yeah, it, it, my fairy tale of potentially you know, leading my home title about it Wembley wasn't to be. You know, it's, um, that's why I don't always believe in fairy tales, right, mate? It's, um, <laughs> Because when they don't happen, it's, it's disappointing. But no, it, it wasn't to me. And then, well, then if you'd have said in November and then training sessions at Christmas, that you get to within 80 minutes of Wembley and then you'd finish in the top four in the championship that year, getting into playoffs, you must have snatched your hands off at the start of the year for that. So you've got to look at it in a positive way as well. Yeah, of course. You know, if somebody said that in November when they'd have seen 12 lads train on the East in, in their own kit and they said, listen, you'll make top four playoffs and you know, be in a semi-final for Wembley, albeit, you know, the 1895, you'd have gone, you'd have probably laughed at them, but, um, you know, as that season went on, we just, we just built and built and built and, you know, looking back, a couple of, a couple of tough, couple of tough games that didn't quite go our way, probably, you know, we could have, we could have ended up higher, higher up in that um, table, you know, because we were winning games, to be fair, to be fair, like a team like York as well, they kept winning games, we couldn't shake them off and, you know, Featherstone being Featherstone, they always come good. You know, and they showed real, you know, form back end of the year. And you know, we're unlucky, enough, you know, for probably for sixty minutes of that final. They, they were in with the show, but um, yeah, just probably a couple of games too far for us back end of the year. You know, a couple of injuries, lads carrying knocks. You know, whether that pre-season coming up a bit short and just got us. You know, the deflation of not getting to Wembley. You know, because that knocks a bit out to you. So, yeah, a few, you know, a few accumulation of things there got us probably. Just got a shot in the end and a bit flat. And then, well, obviously, we played our old rivals, Featherston, in the first playoff game. However, the lead up to that game was mainly around you, Mickey, and because I think it was the week before you announced that you were going to retire at the end of the season. Was that always in your mind to do it before then? And obviously, it would have been your last game at least Sports Village with the way that the playoff games worked. Was that always in the back of your mind, but you want to say a proper goodbye to the Lee fans if people weren't thinking about going to the game? Yeah, it was to be honest. Yeah, because obviously, you know, circumstances prior before I didn't get I get I didn't get a chance to, you know, properly say goodbye in that you know, not through you know, not through my own choice really. It was, you know, things that happened a few years back. But um, yeah, I spoke to Duff's about it. Duff said, you know, I think it'd be a good thing, mate. You know, it's um be a nice way to because potentially I think that was our only home game in the playoffs if we won if we won, we'd have to go away in a way. So, you know, it was I think it was I felt like it was the right time for me. You know, obviously, if we'd have won, it'd have been my last game there. And obviously, losing it'd been my last game in 
in my career. So yeah, it was um, it was something that we talked about, and you know, um, I felt it was the right thing to do. And obviously, we didn't we didn't get on the right end of that one again. It was well, we come. I thought I thought were outstanding that day. They probably played the you know some of the best rugby they played all year. And again, it was, that, it was just that step too far for us. And nice to bow out to LSV, but obviously not nice to lose a game. But yeah, it was um, a fitting send off, and it was pretty emotional at the end. You know, it kind of upset me. You know, having yeah. friends and family and teammates around in your last game, especially being at Lee, it was um, yeah, it was emotional to say the least. And then, obviously, like you said, it was in front of an off stand as well. Was that always like? Was that like kind of a fitting moment for you? That was your last goodbye. Was in front of that North Stand that's cheered you on for so many years, and you scored some wonderful tries there. And Saint Helens in the Super League, your last try of your career was in front of an North Stand as well. So was it fitting that you got to say goodbye to them first? Yeah, of course it was. Yeah, because like I said, being a Lee lad, I've oh, obviously I've been at the old ground when I was watching Lee, but I've been a Lee lad all my life watching Lee, and you know I've been so proud to play from debut for Lee and, and come back and, and play as well and you know especially LSV with that crowd it's yeah it was a nice it was a nice way to finish you know in front of them guys to say thank you for all the support they've certainly given me and you know this time through through hard times and good times they've, they've been there and I said the crowd throughout the year for a team that you know that probably nobody gives us a chance and I don't, I don't think the fans are expecting anything to be honest they were just kind of like we're just glad we've got a Lee team all year and you know it, I think just showed by the commitment and the lads wanted to play in Lee shirts. It, they, they were fantastic all year, and yeah, it was a nice way to say thank you and goodbye, especially you know in front of all them. And then it was the end of season's awards due, and you had another special award given to you by the club for your services to rugby league, which was presented as a bit of a surprise to you by your old mate Chris Hill. That must have been a nice feeling as well, seeing someone like Chris come over and helping the Lee team give a good proper farewell to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was real nice touch off to us. You know, he's brilliant like John. He's always like looking to recognise when players have done things, even like during the season, like whether it's like somebody's a thousand thousand points or their hundredth career appearance or two hundredth or you know, hundredth try. He's very good like again, past players in and, and giving awards out or whether, whether it just be a little plaque with a picture on it. He's, he's brilliant like I think it goes a long way that and yeah, the um the surprise of the, the awards night, you know, wasn't I weren't expecting nothing because you know I'm not. That's a bit what I'm like. You know I don't. I don't expect nothing to be honest. And I didn't even know Chris was coming. And he just said, "Are you there tonight?" I said, "Yeah, yeah." He said, "Oh, I'm going." So I thought I'd just been invited to come and have a few beers, whatever. And yeah, then I got the award, and it was again. It was a pretty, pretty emotional lump in the throat to say when I got the award off him. And you know, a good friend of mine now, a close family friend, Chris. You know, travelled with him a few years at Warrington. And you know, watch him. It was nice to see Chris, you know, give that to me because I've, I've watched Chris develop into a, you know, a world class front rower, you know, and captain, captain his club and play for his country, you know. Um, so yeah, it was it was it was really really nice, Chris, and you know, good friend as well. And then, so obviously, you went back into the coaching side, and you you took on your strength and conditioning role full time. But pre season, obviously, a bit different from playing. You must have had itchy feet throughout all the pre season, and probably through the first couple of games of the season as well. Oh yeah, killed me. Honestly, killed me. Whether you know, you speak to some players and they're like, "Yeah, I can't, not missing it whatsoever." I'll be honest, I was missing it. Even missing the train aspect, you know, I enjoyed it with the, all the lads. But like, what kind of when my job was done, they're all over to Duffs and Jay and Andor doing the team stuff and the rugby. I'm kind of like felt like redundant at the side watching, and it was it was tough to watch the lads go through all the rugby stuff together. And, and then, then then first few like, friendlies and game, first few games of the season on that sideline, I'm sending messages on it were. Um, like we're driving mad. I had to contain myself, but um, it's getting it was getting easier each week. But um, by no means it was easy. You know, um, I am missing it. You know, um, I just wish I was a little bit younger and I could do a few more years. But it's like they say, you know, good things have come to an end. What's your thoughts on this Lee squad for twenty twenty? Have they got the potential to, if promotion happens with everything that's going on with this pandemic, would Lee? Thriving Super League if they got promoted this year because they look like they're building a really strong squad and they've pushed teams like Hull KR to within seven seconds of victory. Shows that they have got the quality about them this year. Yeah, I do. I just think we've got that um, that little bit of steel about us this year. You know, we brought some players in with like who are not like not old, but they've they're very experienced. Certainly in Super League Championship, you know, like a bit of both. They've experienced up and downs and they've played a lot of games. 
um, which I know I think it's a massive, uh, a big thing that you know got a good ingredient, got some youngsters well coming through and who are given an opportunity, whether it's loan, dual reg, sign for us for that experience. And um, no, I think we've got a real good blend of you know experienced youth. And again, um, I don't know. I thought I thought we were cause not lost a game in championship to the start, convincing. But I still think we had a few more gears in us to go up. So no, I think all the signs were there for a a real strong year. You know, to play a Super League team with twelve men for twenty minutes of that game, and you know, to be, probably felt a little bit hard done by at the end. You know. The, there wasn't much in the in the teams, probably okay, probably just edge possession and stuff, but up until that try at the end, you know, we were going through into the next draw. The next round, so it was bitterly disappointing that. That was um, a tough one to take that. But um no, I think we're so quietly confident we could have done a job this year and well hopefully if we still get a chance to we can. I mean you mentioned the disappointment of that game then, but does it show the character of the squad that we played Went on the half of the second half, basically, with a man down due to Simbins and still managed to be leading up until the last seven seconds and defending like they did do. Do you think that showed how much of a tight group this group is this year? Yeah, 100%. You know, um, I've noticed in training, you know, they're, they're very competitive. They want to win, even in training. You know, it almost it almost gets to that point where lads are squaring up and, you know, it's, it's what does and, you know, we know that like that's just the passion and the, the will, the, you know, that drive to win so and, I, and I've seen that in games you know that, that will to defend their own trial line at times and, and keep working for each other it's a special I think it's a special trait to have that when you've got that togetherness and that, that will to everybody wants to win but like that will to really not lose and defend you know and defend and defend again and do it again and, and I thought for periods of that game where we didn't have a lot of ball we defended and we looked tired but then we, we got through it and we looked strong towards the end to be honest it were okay we were hanging on and so obviously got a chance later on and they took it you know that's that little bit of quality in Super League you know when you're playing against quality opposition week in week out and you know and even though OK at the time they, you know they were raving how many injuries they had but they still had internationals in the team like you, you Sean Kenny Dowles and you know you Kane Lynette on the other centre you know two NRL who weren't just NRL they were good NRL players then you know quality you know throw that in with like your Quinlans and you know a few others who were who were playing, you know, it's they still had a they still had a good strong squad. But um no, it was it was a little setback, but the lads weren't too down about it afterwards. Well a few days after they were down about it after the game, like, because it was a we thought we should have got something from the game, but what this put again what these lads are good at, they, they dust themselves off and they go again and, and they rip in at training. So and to be fair, obviously while we're on this, you know, lockdown stuff, they've been training their house down again on their own. I can only and only commend them on what they're doing. Obviously, you mentioned the lockdown then, and we don't know what the future is for the sport of rugby or what the Super is going to look like next year. I mean, if you was in charge, would you maybe have a team go up, a team go down, or Tony Smith came up with a licensing idea maybe for a couple of years, so then clubs can send a ship and then go for promotion relegation? I mean, if you was in charge, which way would you look at going about things? Yeah, it's a tough one, because I think if you don't play all your games or they cut the season short and you're bottom of the league and... You probably, and, you, and you end up getting relegated, you're going to feel like done by. And, you know, same with like promotion, if they cancel promotion or they do promotion, you, you've not had a fair crack at the whip because you've, you've had a few injuries at the start of the year, but you build the momentum, but it's not quite enough. So, yeah, when they, they take it up to 14 teams and, you know, take two in and have a, a year or two, you know, licensing system like they've done before, like, and then bring it back in, you know. I'd like to think if, you know, they do that, we, we, we could be in with a strong shout of that because, you know, our, our fan base is brilliant. The stadium's brilliant. Facilities are brilliant. We've got everything there. You know, we've got a we've got a team that's you know was was probably the farm team of the championship at the start of the year that was in Toulouse. So yeah, I'd, I'd I'd be I'd consider it. It's just whether they've how they're going to go about it. Fit, again, not fulfilling all the fixtures. Whether they do three games in a week or they like you said, they kind of shorten the season with no promotion. Bring t- I don't know, but um, yeah, I, I think it's not a bad idea to be honest. As long as, we're, well, as long as we're in that mix and we can go up. <laughs> what would your thoughts be, obviously, on being a strength and conditioning coach if they did decide to go for three games a week? How would you look at coaching odds? Do you think it is feasible to do that, especially in a league and a championship where we are a hybrid squad with some full-time, some part-time? Uh, again, being a, you'll ask any rugby player, certainly I am, you know, more, probably 95%. 
they do want to play games and they'll they'll do what they ask of you. You know, they'll if it's three games a week, they'll play it because I know what lads are like. I've, I've done it myself, not potentially not on this basis, but I remember my first year when I come back to Lee, we're filling some games up midweek as well. So we've done it before. Obviously, I'm not sure how long you can sustain that, but as a you know, as a coach and a strength and conditioner, I'd, I'd certainly I'd have to have a massive focus on recovery because you obviously you know you're limited. You know, we'd have to make sure they get the recovery in. You know, fl- hydration, food, sleep would be massive. You know, and and, and um, you know, and just kind of just get skills. You know, get the t- get the game plan stuff in because the short turnaround. So yeah, not ideal from a, a strength and conditioner because you like to like them maintaining with the weight their stuff and. You know, top ups, but yeah, we've got a pretty big squad for championship. I think we've got a decent, strong squad. So, if, you know, potentially we could rotate, use your full squad. You know, some lads who've not been getting games will, you know, be playing games. So at least it's good to get your full squad in. But just whether for the long term, not sure it's good on lads' bodies. You know, especially if you're doing that and then you you've got promotion to Super League, say, and you've got a short time to you know to get to turn around and, and start back in pre-season because you've got to be up to speed in Super League because it's. You know, you're up against seasoned teams that've been there for years, and the quality of play goes up as well. So it's, yeah, it's a tough ask, but um, you know, hopefully, we'll, whatever comes of it, we'll hopefully we'll be there thereabouts. And I'm sure, like you said, that we'll, we'll go in with the same drive that you have as a player to this coaching role as well. Just before we ask you a few quick fire questions throughout your career, I want to ask you just a couple of personal questions. If an opportunity came for you to maybe be a head coach somewhere else, would that be something to be? Looking at considering in the future, or is this? Are you happy settling in this role now and then? Maybe in future going as a head coach? No, I won't. I won't make any any. You know, I won't. I won't uh, beat around the bush. I, I have got some aspirations to coach as well. You know, I do enjoy the you know the strength and conditioning side. I've always enjoyed the training aspect of the game, but I have got a bit of passion for the coaching side as well. So you know, if it's some, an opportunity come up potentially, I'd have to I'd have to give it some thought certainly. But at the moment, I'm really enjoying the role. You know. Um, We've got a close knit bunch of players, a real close knit group of staff, you know, and we're, and we're close to our players as well. So yeah, it's, it's really enjoyable. It's been a tough year because straight in, you know, me and Duff's are full time. We've been straight in at full time, so it's it's been a shock to the system. You know, getting used to it, but again, kind of sometimes you need that to get you up to speed, and you know, you throw in at the deep end, and you do a lot of learning. That you know, by no means I'm nowhere near. I mean, I've made mistakes. I've some sessions have not always been right. Well, that's you know to me that's part of the learning curve, and I always ask for like you know feedback off the coach and the lads as well, especially your experienced lads. I just say uh, give us some feedback because you know I am still learning. So yeah, it's, um, I'm really enjoying it. But you know who, who knows what happens in the future. You know, let's see where see where we go first, Willie. And obviously, try fitness as well keeps going from strength to strength. You're doing more Facebook live classes, obviously throughout the lockdown. When all this situation comes back and you're able to go back into a gym, what's the plans on? Maybe expanding, getting more classes in, more PTs. Is there any opportunities for that to come around when? This well, yeah, absolutely. Ends? Yeah, um, I said just before the gym, we had to shut. We, we were having big numbers. You know, the class, the gym was buzzing. It really was. It was a good feel. You know, I kind of pride myself on having a, a good community family feel. At the, you know, at the gym, like I've always done with, with my rugby. So yeah, it's going good. And I just thought I could give a little bit for them people who've you know been valued customers for years. Just a few Facebook sessions, keep them ticking over at home. I've I've lent all my equipment out. You know, I've said, come in and take whatever you need, just write on the board. So I've, all my equipment's being used by, by my um, customers at home, my members and that. So that's good. They're enjoying that. And so, see what happens with the rugby. You know, if anything changes with the rugby, then I'll look at potentially taking that gym, building back up. But I'm hoping, you know, I want to get the green, green light to open the door again. It'll People will come flooding back. Because I know a lot of people saying they can't wait to get back in gym. Because not everybody struggles at home. It's not. It's not easy at home. For, you know, motivate yourself. You know, it's, um, it's, it's you can get into a bit of a rut at home, and you know, it's tough. But to be fair, a few people have been, you know, getting into it and keep ticking over. So hopefully, they'll, when the time comes, we'll we'll be back and busy and better than ever. And obviously, like you said, it's good. It's a good thing that you're still keeping that going for people at home. But I know you said it struggles, but people are still then able to. Kind of still keep the routine. I think, all right, I've got a class at six o'clock now. Do you think maybe having it at them times as well? It's like, yeah, you've got your structured times now. You know what you're doing. It's up to you now whether you want to do it or not. Yeah, and that, that was kind of a bit of reason behind it. You know, people have been used to, you know, doing the six o'clock because obviously some people are still working as well. You know, I know, you know, not everybody start working, whether, you know, they're working in, in and around NHS or base, whatever it is, schools and stuff. So 
you know, some people are still working during the day. So that was my reasoning behind it. Obviously, sometimes if people who come to the gym and they're not working, they might not want to do it at six o'clock because they're settling down having the tea and stuff. But <clears throat> majority have seemed all right. But a lot of people as well have been saying, listen, can't make one tonight. I'm, I'm at work. I'm going I'm to do that in the morning when, you know, when I wake up. So people are doing it the day after. So they are still getting used and viewed. And so, you know, which is, I'm, I'm glad really, at least people are still doing it. So, yeah, it's, um, it's working. Seems to be working all right at the moment. So here we go now. We'll end it on some quick fire questions on your rugby career. So, favourite home ground, first of all, that you played at? Favourite home ground? <laughs> um, Hilton Park was a cracker. You know, um, made my debut for Lee there. Hilton Park was brilliant. Um, LSV is brilliant. And, you know, I did, I did like Alliwell Jones as well. You know, I got atmosphere there as well. Um, favourite coach that you played under? Um, certainly Ian Millward you know gave me opportunity you know early, early in my career you know it was tough on me but um, you know he, he gave me opportunity you know moved me along to some clubs as well and then Tony Smith come in and kind of helped me progress my career as I was growing up you know I think <clears throat> it's quite easy when you're a player and you know getting to a mid-twenties late-twenties that you think you, you've done enough and you know what you're doing and Tony certainly <coughs> helped me to um, progress my career I was getting best, older as well, so, yeah. Best player you played alongside in your distinguished career? I've played with some, played with some good ones, mate, to be honest. Um, <laughs> say my early years at St. Helens, you know, I've had the privilege to play alongside you. Sean Long, your Paul Schoolthorpe's, uh, Kieran Cunningham, you know. <coughs> Jamie Lyon for a season, you know, got Man of Steel like his first season, unbelievable. Um, Paul Wellens went to Wigan, you know, Trent Barrett come over, what a player he was. I'll tell you, you know, he never got Man of Steel in his first year, I'll never know. <laughs> he was a travesty, yeah, Trent Barrett. Then Adrian Morley, probably up there with the best I played with. You know, Ben Westwood as well, so there's just a few. I could, you know, I could name a few more, but, you know, there's, I've had the privilege to play with some great players. Favourite away ground that you played at? Uh, I used to like playing Edinley, Edinley at Leeds, you know, used to be rocking Friday nights. Bradford as well, when Bradford were a big force in Super League, that used to be a brilliant ground as well. Um, two great games, great atmospheres, always good games there. You know, um, Wigan, Wigan as well, it was, a, it was a brilliant home ground for me as well for three years and I used to like going playing there as well, so Wigan's in between as well. <coughs> Most memorable try of your career? Um... Probably, I don't know really. Um, certainly for Lee, two that stick out was my first one in Super League for Lee. I think I'd missed the first couple of games to injury and I come back against St. Helens, you know, one of my old clubs, and managed to kind of score the winner under in front of the north stand. So that was one that sticks out. And probably the one at Summer Bash against Bradford. You know, we didn't play great that game, but we were still in with a chance and remember just pointed to drink it, Josh Drinkwater, just put that ball under the post, see what happens, and I managed to get there, and I remember looking up, and, you know, it was in, it was in with all the lead speckers as well, I remember seeing my wife, and all the friends, and all the lads from Lee, and my mates, and that, absolutely, you know, piling down, to, to, to front of Sandy, it was unbelievable, um, there were two good ones, um, what else? I don't know really, kind of, Probably scoring my first try for England in the World Cup against New Zealand. You know, um, got off to a good start in that, scored a little sneaky barge over. You know, it's always great to get one for your country. So, Wembley or, Challenge, or Old Trafford, Challenge Cup or Grand Final? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Grand Final. Just the, I said, Challenge Cup's brilliant, don't get me wrong, you know, I, I, it's everything a player dreams. Certainly, when you're a kid, I think it's everything you dream of. Being a young kid walking out to Wembley in the Challenge Cup, because he's. I think when you're a kid, certainly when I was at my age, a kid, it was more. I think the Challenge Cup was a bit more prestigious at the time. But certainly, when you start playing professional and that, and you've won it and you've won Grand Finals, I think for me the, the Grand Final just sticks out in front because it's. It's just that accumulation of all that hard work all year. You know, from like cold, wet, frosty, you know, snowy mornings, running up hills. Wrestling in mud, you know, doing the tough stuff. And then to you see it all come, you know, in in a season, and then 
you know, it comes to fruition at the end of the grand final on a, you know, what October night, Old Trafford, like the atmosphere at Old Trafford is unbelievable. It's just electric. And it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a fitting end to what, you know, you've been a great year, but I've won it and I've lost the grand final. It's, um, it's not a nice feeling though when you, you've gone all that way and you've, you've, you've come up short. It's, it's a tough pill to, to swallow that. But yeah, I think the grand final just edges it for me. <laughs> so, there we are with Mickey. I've got to ask you as well, Mickey. Favourite commentator slash podcast presenter, who would you pick Ooh. for that one? Yeah. <laughs> tough one, that. <laughs> I think it's a tough one as well, you know. Mm. I go on, I'll, um, it's a fellow that's just started up now, called uh, Ryan Taylor. I'll, I'll give yeah. you that one. You are, like we said, with the first interview on the Taylor Talks podcast, which should hopefully be going online soon. We've done it, had to film it over a week because technical problems and <laughs> lockdowns. Not, not been easy on us, has it, as well? Oh, it's so, not uh, no. So I'd just like to say, Mickey, thank you very much. Good luck for the rest of the season with the Lee Centurions when eventually the season starts and good luck with your rugby career as well. Thanks, mate, and all the best. Yeah, I'll see you soon.